please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and click on that like button if you like my video. Also click on that notification bell. Thank you. Hi folks. The job market for Linux is still strong and growing because a large number of corporate applications run on and depend on Linux operating system. The average Linux system administrator salary is about 90,000 USD. If you want to learn Linux and get a job in Linux field, then take my best selling course, Complete Linux Training to get your dream IT job. But if you are a beginner and want to know if Linux is something you can learn, then take this course, Linux for Beginners. Hi, my name is Imran Afsal, and I've been in IT for over 20 years. I have almost a million students worldwide and I have many bestseller and highest rated courses online. I earned my bachelor's degree in CIS from Baruch College, City University of New York and my MBA from New York Institute of Technology. In this course, you will explore everything from Linux background to its basic and more advanced aspects of administration. So let's get this journey started. Hey folks, let's spend a couple of minutes and understand what exactly we are learning in this entire course. This course has four different sections. All right, section one, I'm covering everything about introduction to Linux, meaning we'll go through the basics of operating system, then into Linux. We'll cover the history and benefits. Then we'll go into different Linux flavor and also the comparison between Windows and Linux. Then I want to clear the confusion a lot of people have about Linux and kernel. Then we'll go into the future of Linux. A lot of people have a question whether Linux is going to be around or not. We'll talk about that in this specific video. Then, of course, Linux job market. If you're learning Linux, is it going to actually beneficial in terms of getting a job? We'll cover that in this video. Then in section two, we'll design and set up the lab. That is about the designing and downloading, installing virtualization software, and then doing the installation of Linux operating system. And then we'll cover the accessing the Linux system. Moving on to section three, it's about the Linux basic administration. We'll start with the Linux file system its structure, directory properties, Linux file navigation commands, we'll go into file management commands. Also, Linux file content display commands such as cat, more, head, tail, many other commands. Then moving on to section four, which is about advanced administration, we'll cover changing the password, the content manipulation command, commands I'm sure you heard of like cut, awk, grab, sort, unique, and many others. Then we'll go through Linux file permissions, then security management, user account management, and at the end we will learn Linux editor, which is something that you should definitely need to know if you are going to add content to a file. All right, let's dive right into it and let's start learning Linux. If you want to learn more about Linux, check out my best-selling course on Linux at udemy.com or you could go straight to my website, utclsolutions.com, and you will find the exact same course there. Hey, beautiful people. In this video, I want to spend some time and go over the operating system. Now, of course, our focus in this entire course is Linux. And Linux is an operating system. So before we start getting into Linux, let's understand what exactly an operating system is. So, as per Wikipedia, an operating system is system software that manages computer hardware and software resources and provides common services for computer programs. Or in simple words, an operating system, in short OS, is software that acts as a middleman or a bridge between computer hardware and the computer users. What other hardware like CPU, memory, disks, and who is the computer user? You are the computer users. It provides a user interface and controls the computer hardware so the software can function. Now, which software are we talking about here? Software or applications that actually run on your computer. Now, let me ask you a question. 
Why do you use computer? Because you want to use certain applications, right? You want to use, for example, Microsoft Word, Excel. You want to get online. You want to use Firefox or Chrome browser. You want to use calendar, calculator. All those applications are the main reason you have your computer at home, right? So when you start up your computer, the very first thing that starts up is your operating system, which allows you to start or operate other applications running or installed in your computer. Okay, now let's go over the different type of operating systems. The first one is desktop operating system. These operating systems are like Microsoft Windows, Mac OS, and Linux such as Ubuntu. They run on your regular computer or your laptop that you are using probably every day at home or in the office. Then you have server operating systems, for example, Windows Server, Linux distributions like CentOS, Red Hat, SUSE, and so on. These type of operating systems are actually run on corporate or enterprise level environment. Then mobile operating system, for example, Android, iOS, Windows Mobile. If you have Samsung Fool, you have Android operating system that controlling the phone. If you have Apple phone, you have iOS operating system in it. If you have Microsoft phone, then you have Windows Mobile operating system running on it. Then embedded operating systems used in devices like routers, smart TVs, automobiles, home appliances. Then you have real-time operating systems. In short, RTOS, used in critical systems like medical equipment, car ECUs, aerospace, defense, network firewalls, home security system, and so on. So I hope you have a better understanding now what exactly an operating system is. Now we will jump into Linux, which is an operating system. Let's get into our main topic, and that is Linux. We will talk about what exactly Linux is in this video. Now, I'm sure you probably know Linux. Some of you already have heard of Linux. Some of you already know how it works. But all I'm asking you is that you stick around with me for a few minutes and you will have a very good understanding of what Linux is. Linux is an open source operating system that manages your computer hardware resources and applications. Okay, now the question is, what is open source? Open source basically means that the language or the code that is used to write and build that Linux software, that code is open to public. Anyone can go and view that code. That's why it's open source and it could be modified. So the second question is, what are computer hardware resources? Well, computer hardware resources like CPU, memory, disk space, network. Now, if you don't know any of these or some of these resources, then I would recommend that you take my IT fundamental course. And that course will teach you everything you need to know about IT basic concepts. Okay, so Linux is an operating system just like Windows or Mac operating system. Okay, if it is just like Windows or Mac, then the question is, why don't you hear much about Linux? Great question. Well, it's because it's a behind the scene use. Linux is heavily used in an environment that typically consumers don't use or see directly. For example, it is used mainly on servers, on embedded systems, on supercomputers. Also, it is mostly used in enterprise or corporate level environment. So if you have never worked in corporate level or don't have an exposure to the IT environment, then you don't know what Linux is. Okay, I just mentioned that operating system Linux is just like Windows operating system, then why can't we just use Windows? All right, if that's what you're thinking, again, great question. Let me explain you why. Windows is slower than Linux because of GUI. Now, what is GUI? 
GUI is graphical user interface, which means that every time you start up your Windows computer, you will see everything so easy, like in windowing environment, you could drag, drop, move your mouse and do a lot of things. And it's become so much easier to manage that operating system. Now in Linux, you don't see that GUI things in corporate world, especially there are GUI uh, type of uh, Linux systems, but most of the times people don't use GUI in Linux. So not having that GUI, which takes a lot of processing power that gives an advantage to Linux over Windows. Then another reason is Windows is not open source. Yes, because you don't see the code, you cannot modify the code, you cannot make it work the way you want it to work based on your applications. That's why corporate environment don't really use much or prefer Linux over Windows. And the last one is Linux provide higher level security than Windows. Yes, Linux has a lot of built-in features that has a very extensive security level built-in features than Windows. So that's about Linux. What is Linux? Why do we use Linux? What's the whole story about Linux? So I hope you have a lot more information now. Let's go to our next video. If you want to learn more about Linux, check out my best-selling course on Linux at udemy.com or you could go straight to my website, utclsolutions.com and you will find the exact same course there. Hey folks, in this video, we will cover the history of Linux. So we will start from the very beginning. What was there before Linux? Before Linux, it was an operating system called Unix. And by the way, it still exists. Developed in 1970 at AT&T Bell Labs by Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie. Unix was a revolutionary operating system for its time, introducing many features that would become standard. However, Unix was not freely available and had various proprietary versions. Then came GNU project. In 1983, Richard Stallman launched the GNU. GNU, it's not Unix project with the aim of creating a free Unix-like operating system. While many tools and utilities were developed under the GNU project, a complete free OS was missing a kernel. Then Linux was born. In 1991, a 21-year-old Finland student named Linus Torvalds started developing a free operating system kernel as a hobby project. On August 25th, 1991, Linus announced his project on the Minix News Group with the famous words, I am doing a free operating system. Just a hobby. Won't be big and professional like GNU. All right. Then version 0.01 released in September 1991. This version our very first version of the Linux kernel was not functional, but was released to the public to view and comment upon. Then came version 0.02, released later in 1991. This version was functional and combined with the utilities from the GNU project. It formed a complete free operating system. This combination of Linux kernel with the tools from the GNU project came to be commonly known as Linux, although some advocate for it to be called GNU slash Linux. All right, let's see the growth and evolution of Linux. In early 1990s, Linux rapidly evolved through collaboration over the Internet. Distributions often referred to as distros, like Slackware and Debian, emerge, making it easier for users to get a complete Linux-based operating system. Then in 1994, 1.0 version was released with 176,000 lines of code. Then late 1990s, Commercial interest in Linux grew. Companies like Red Hat and SUSE 
provide commercial support for Linux, making it viable for business use. Then in 2000, Linux saw significant adoption in server markets. It became the OS of choice for various emerging markets like embedded system and supercomputers. Then Android in 2007, Google released the Android OS for mobile devices, which is based on the Linux kernel. This gave Linux an enormous boost in the mobile market. All right, let's see what is it doing today. Linux has grown from a hobbyist project into a powerful force in computing, powering everything from mobile devices, personal computers, and servers to mainframes and supercomputers. The principles of open source on which Linux is based have also influenced the development of various other software projects and even fields outside of software. So simply put, the story of Linux isn't about a computer system. It's about great people from all over the world working together and making this a reliable, secure, and open source operating system. Many thanks to them. In this video, we are going to cover the benefits of Linux. Linux has gained widespread adoption in various sectors, from personal computers to servers, uh, mobile devices, and embedded systems. Let's go over some of the primary benefits that Linux has to offer. Number one is open source. Linux is open source software, which means a source code is freely available to anyone. This allows everyone to view, modify, and distribute this operating system. Then we have cost effective. Linux is generally free, though some enterprise distribution might have associated cost for support and additional features. Those operating systems are such as like a Red Hat operating system or SUSE Linux. This makes it an attractive option for both individuals and businesses wanting to reduce software licensing cost. Then the next one is security. Linux has a strong security architecture. Its permission and authentication model offers a robust layer of system protection. The open source nature allows for rapid detection and patching of all vulnerabilities as well. So of course, when it, you know the code, you could change the code, and when you find out those vulnerabilities, you could secure them right away. Then the next one is stability and reliability. Linux systems are known for their stability and can run for years without needing a reboot. Crashes in one application generally don't affect the whole system because one Linux system can actually support multiple applications that can run simultaneously. Then the next one is flexibility. Linux is highly configurable. Users can add, modify, or replace any part of the operating system for their specific needs. This makes it suitable for a wide range of devices and use cases from supercomputers to IoT devices. Then the next one is software repositories. Most Linux distributions have vast software repositories, which allow users to easily search, install, and update required software packages. Then portability. Linux can run on various hardware platforms from x86 and ARM architectures to mainframes. Then community support. Due to its widespread adoption and the open source model, Linux boosts a large and active community that provides documentation, forum, tutorials, and other forms of support. So if you do not have a Linux subscription or support, you could go to the community support and ask for any issues you are having, and they will be happy to help you out. Then customization. Users can choose from multiple desktop environments, window managers, and themes, allowing 
for highly personalized experience, of course. Then the next one comes low hardware requirements. Linux can run on older hardware that might not be compatible with newer versions of Windows or Mac OS. So of course, giving life to older devices. Then the next one is multitasking. Linux support multi users and multitasking operations right from its core. Next one is file system. Linux supports a wide range of file systems like ext4, btrfs, and xfs, and many newer file systems. Then comes the networking. Linux offers robust networking features, making it a preferred choice of servers and network management task. And there are many tools that are used in Linux that allows you to configure Linux networking. Then we have transparency. Users can study the source code to understand the working of the system or to ensure there aren't any unwanted features or backdoors. Then the next one is regular updates. You could get regular updates to any issues or bugs you have in the system. And the last one, or of course, not the least one, there are many more advantages. So this one is less vulnerable to malware. Linux security model and the smaller market share in the personal desktop segment make it less frequent target for malware compared to other operating systems. All right, these were some of the benefits of Linux, which gives its popularity in corporate world. And of course, in the end, it all depends on your application requirement and your choice. If you want to learn more about Linux, check out my best-selling course on Linux at udemy.com, or you could go straight to my website, utclsolutions.com, and you will find the exact same course there. In this video, we will go over the most used Linux flavors. When people refer to Linux flavors, they typically mean Linux distributions or distros for short. We have all these different distributions to serve various user needs and preferences. Here's an overview of some popular Linux distributions. The first one is Ubuntu, or sometimes people call it Ubuntu, one of the most popular distributions especially for those new to Linux. It is based on Debian. It provides a user-friendly experience and is backed by Canonical Limited. Then the next one is Fedora, sponsored by Red Hat. It is known for its cutting edge features and innovations. Fedora Workstation is used for desktop users. Fedora Server and Fedora Silverblue used as a version that does not change these are some of the some of its flavors. Then Debian, a community driven project known for its stability, provides the foundation for many other distributions, including Ubuntu. Then we have a Red Hat Enterprise Linux, in short, RHEL, a commonly backed distribution from Red Hat, designed for businesses and enterprises provides long-term support, stability, and enterprise-level features. A lot of companies, I would say about roughly about 70 to 80% of the corporate environment uses RHEL. Then we have CentOS or CentOS, a free and open-source clone of RHEL, designed to provide a similar experience without the associated costs. However, its direction has changed after CentOS 8 with the introduction of CentOS Stream. Then Arch Linux, a rolling release system that's known for its simplicity and customization. Users build their system from the ground up, choosing components they desire. It has a well-known version name Manjaro that tries to make using Arch simpler. Then the next one is OpenSUSE. Comes in two main flavors, Tumbleweed, which is the rolling release, and Leap, which is a regular release, and is sponsored by SUSE Linux. The next one is Linux Mint. Based on Ubuntu, it provides a more detailed and traditional desktop experience. It comes with built-in special tools to play media. Then the next one is Gen2, 
source-based distribution where users compile software from source code. Highly customizable and, and optimized for the user's specific hardware. Then comes the next one, which is Slackware. One of the oldest distribution known for its simplicity and minimalism. The next one is Alpine Linux, a lightweight distribution designed for security, simplicity, and resource efficiency, making it popular for containerized applications. Then the last one, but not the least one because there are a lot more, Kali Linux, a distribution designed for digital forensics and penetration testing. These are just some of the many Linux distributions available. Each distribution has its unique features, strengths, target audience, and philosophy. The right distribution for a user typically depends on their needs, preferences, and intended use case. Now, if you are getting into Linux and you wanted to actually, your end goal is to get a job in Linux, in corporate world, then I would strongly recommend that you go with CentOS, which is the exact replica of Red Hat Enterprise Linux and is mostly used in all the corporate world. If you want to learn more about Linux, check out my best-selling course on Linux at udemy.com or you could go straight to my website utclsolutions.com and you will find the exact same course there. Linux and Windows are two distinct operating systems with different architectures, design philosophies, and use cases. Here's a comparison of their key differences. The first difference is its origin and development. In Linux, it is open source developed by a global community of contributors. Linux is based on Unix operating system whereas Windows is a proprietary system developed by Microsoft Corporation. And you know who owns or who started Microsoft? Yes, Bill Gates. Then the next one is cost. So Linux, most distributions are free to download, use, and distribute. Whereas Windows, typically you have to purchase a license or a new computer that comes with Windows pre-installed. Then the next one is user interface. Linux offers a variety of desktop environments, for example, Genome, KDE, XFCE, that the user can choose from allowing for customizable look and feel. In Windows, it has a consistent interface such as, you know, every time you have Windows, you go to the Start menu, the taskbar, all the same across its various systems, but with some redesigns over time. Then the next one is customization. Linux, of course, is highly customizable. Users can modify almost every aspect of the system. In Windows, it's less customizable in comparison with certain aspects locked down or limited. Then the next one is software or application installation that you install on top of the operating system. So in Linux, it uses package managers. For example, apt, yum, pacman, depending on, of course, the flavor of Linux that you're running. These are the tools that are used to install software and they get pulled usually from a centralized repository. In Windows, typically software is downloaded as an executable file or .msi file from websites or stores from where you could get it downloaded. Then the next one is security. Linux generally consider more secure due to its permission structure and the open source nature that allows vulnerabilities to be spotted and fixed quickly. In Windows, it is less secure because historically a larger target for malware due to its widespread use. But modern versions of Windows has significantly improved in security. Then the next one is updates. Linux 
Updates are managed by package managers and can update all software on the system at once. Users often have more control over when and how updates are applied. In Windows, it uses a Windows update for system and some software updates. Now, historically, Windows might be more intrusive. For example, it will force you to restart, which is something you really don't want, especially in production system. Then we have file system. Linux typically uses a file system like ext4, btfrs, or xfs. In Windows, it uses NTFS, and previously it was using FAT32. Then command line. Linux, it is mainly operated with command line and not GUI. Uses a variety of shells, with bash being the most common. The terminal is a significant part of the Linux experience. Now, in Windows, in Windows 10 and later, PowerShell became prominent. Windows subsystem for Linux, which in short WSL, also allows for Linux line command line experience. Then comes gaming. Linux does not offer much gaming experience as it is primarily designed to run corporate level applications such as ERP, SAP, finance and trading, human resources, many different applications. Whereas Windows, the preferred platform for PC gaming with a broad array of titles and extensive driver support from graphic card manufacturers. Then the hardware compatibility. Linux can run on almost every hardware, whether it's old or new. Windows, on the other hand, the newer version of Windows is mostly and only compatible with the newer hardware. So these were the key differences between Windows and Linux. And by the way, please keep one thing in mind. The purpose of this lecture is not to tell you that Windows is better or Linux is better. It all depends on your application requirement. If you want to learn more about Linux, check out my best-selling course on Linux at udemy.com or you could go straight to my website utclsolutions.com and you will find the exact same course there. Hey beautiful people, in this video we will go over the difference between Linux and kernel. What exactly a kernel is? Where does it reside? Is it the same as Linux? These are many questions that a lot of people have their, in their mind. So I'm going to clear that confusion today. All right, the terms of Linux and kernel refer to different concepts. But remember, they are related. Here's how they are different. First, kernel. The kernel is the core component of an operating system. It is responsible for interacting with the hardware of the computer, managing resources like CPU, memory, and devices, and enabling all the software applications to run. It acts as an intermediary or a bridge between the hardware and the software handling low-level tasks like managing file system, scheduling processes, and controlling peripherals. There are many different types of kernels like monolithic kernel, microkernel, hybrid kernel, each with its architecture and design principle. So let's vision this. You are the user and you are executing a command or typing something on your keyboard. That execution is transferred or given to your operating system. Then operating system tells the kernel to utilize system resources, as I said, CPU memory, to perform or complete your required task. All right, now let's go to Linux. When people refer to Linux, they usually mean a complete 
operating system that uses the Linux kernel at its core. However, of course, strictly speaking, Linux originally refers to just the kernel developed by Linus Torvalds in 1991. A full Linux operating system, also known as a Linux distribution, includes a Linux kernel, system libraries, software applications, and graphical user interface, among other components. For example, of Linux distributions, there are Ubuntu, RHEL, CentOS, Fedora, Debian, each providing a different set of software and user experiences on top of Linux kernel. Now, let me put it in a very simple terms. The kernel is like the engine of your car. It's the essential components that makes the car move, managing all the underlining mechanism. Whereas Linux, of course, in everyday language is like the entire car, including the engine, which is kernel, body, which is sub-libraries and utilities, and interior, like software application and user interfaces. So I hope this actually clarifies the difference between kernel and Linux. But again, in short, kernel is basically a small program that comes inside of an operating system. If you want to learn more about Linux, check out my best-selling course on Linux at udemy.com or you could go straight to my website utclsolutions.com and you will find the exact same course there. Hey folks, in this video we will go over and understand where Linux is going to be in 10 or 15 years. Is it going to be replaced completely by another operating system or something that comes along like artificial intelligence that takes over? Well, you might be wrong because Linux is going to be around for many, many years to come. The future of Linux is likely to be influenced by several prevailing trends and is expected to see continued evolution and growth in various sectors. And of course, I am going to go over all those sectors one by one so you will have a better understanding where Linux is going to be many, many years from now. So we'll go over several predictions regarding the future trajectory of Linux. The first one is continued dominance in cloud and servers. Hmm. Well, cloud and servers, well, isn't that everybody is trying to get into the cloud? They think there are so many jobs. The real future is the cloud. But you, have you ever thought the actual operating system that supports the cloud is actually, or I would say mostly, Linux operating system? Yes, Linux is already a leading operating system for web servers, cloud platforms, and supercomputers. It's likely to maintain and even strengthen its position in these domains due to its stability, security, and flexibility. The next one is development in machine learning and artificial intelligence. Linux is likely to continue being at the forefront of high performance computing, machine learning, and artificial intelligence with ongoing developments and optimization in related libraries and tools. No matter what comes in our way, whether it's artificial intelligence, virtualization, robotics, all of those have to run on some kind of operating system, right? So. The best operating system that they could find to run, which is so secure and customizable, is of course Linux. Then growth in enterprise adoption. More enterprises are likely to adapt Linux for their IT infrastructure. Given its lower total cost of ownership, robust security features, and high customization capability. Now you ask yourself, which operating system with such a low cost gives you so much security and allows you to customize it as well according to the requirement of your application? Okay, moving on, 
advancement in security. Of course, security enhancement of is the major, major game changer that will continue to be the focus with developments in security features and more distributions focusing on privacy and security. Moving on to development in edge computing with the rise of in Internet of Things and edge computing, Linux especially lightweight distributions are well positioned to be the operating system of choice for edge devices and gateways. Then increased or presence in, in mobile industry. Linux based Androids already has a massive share in mobile operating system. There could be further developments, improvements, and possibly new Linux based mobile operating system. Then moving on, widespread use in automotive and embedded system. Yes, all those cars that you drive nowadays, those fancy cars with car plays and all those new features, all supported by Linux embedded system. So Linux is a rapidly growing in embedded systems and the automotive industry, powering everything for infotainment systems to fully autonomous vehicles. Then comes enhancement in containerization and virtualization. Linux will likely to continue to play a pivotal role in ongoing trends in containerization and virtualization technologies with enhancement in related projects and tools. Most of the virtualization systems, whether that virtualization on Amazon, on VMware, all those virtualization, the underlying hypervisor that support virtualization are actually built on Linux. Then we have open source development. The development and enhancement of Linux will continue to be driven by the global community of contributors and the adoption of open source principles. Fostering innovation and collaboration. All right. Moving on to another one, integrated with other systems. So improved integration with other operating systems could be a focus to ensure seamless operation in multi-operating system environment. In essence, the future of Linux is very bright, and it seems to expand its footprint across many various technology sectors and continue to be the pioneer for innovation in computing world. If you want to learn more about Linux, check out my best-selling course on Linux at udemy.com, or you could go straight to my website, utclsolutions.com, and you will find the exact same course there. Do you want to know what a Linux job market looks like? What are the benefits being a Linux professional brings you? Well, stick around. I'm going to go over with every little detail in this video and tell you why it is so important or so valuable to have Linux skills. The job market for Linux is still strong and keeps growing. This is because many different sectors use and depend on Linux operating system a lot. Here are some potential benefits one might experience in Linux related job. The first one is competitive salaries. Yes, can you smell the money? <laughs> Many Linux roles offer competitive salaries due to the specialized knowledge required and the demand for skilled professionals in this field. Linux professionals are well compensated with every average salary ranging from 90 to 150,000 or more. And that data is based on the U.S. labor market, depending, of course, is depending on the experience and skill set. In addition, many Linux jobs offer great benefits such as flexible work arrangements, stock options, and more. Now, talking about flexible work, the next one is flexible work, remote work opportunities. Given the nature of Linux and IT work, 
Many jobs offer flexibility and the possibility to work remotely, which can lead to better work-life balance. That is why I have seen many people actually switching their career from different fields to IT or Linux field especially, so they could enjoy the work-life balance and work remotely. And of course, this can save you a lot of time on commute, which you can spend with your family and friends. Then career advancement. The skills acquired while working on with Linux can pave the way for career advancement and enable transition to roles like Linux engineer or architect or DevOps engineer, IT manager, or maybe one day you could manage the entire infrastructure team. Then a learning and development. So constant learning is often a part of Linux related jobs due to the evolving nature of technology, which can be rewarding and can lead to acquisitions of new skills and knowledge. Job security. Yes, everybody want to make sure they can pay the bills. And that could happen if you have a, a permanent, a secure job. The demand for Linux skills and the widespread use of Linux in various sectors contribute to job security and availability of opportunities in this field. You're probably the last person to let go in your company if you possesses that critical Linux skill. Even from my personal experience for all these years, I could tell you that I have seen so many people being laid off and the people who actually stayed back were the people with the technical skills. And out of those technical people, Linux jobs were the ones that were more secured because they were the one who had to support those servers. Then networking opportunities. Engaging with Linux and open source community can provide valuable networking opportunities and exposure to different perspectives and ideas. And you know what they say? Network is the key. So you get opportunities to meet people and grow. Then, of course, there are many other benefits such as certification and training opportunities. You can be a contributor to open source community. You will have the entrepreneurial opportunity where you could start your own business and you know how to run your infrastructure. You could have global opportunities around the world. So Linux jobs not only offer tangible benefits like competitive salaries and career advancement, but also intangible benefits like continuous learning, flexibility, and the opportunity to contribute to the open source community. Beautiful. Now, let's go over some job areas and roles where Linux is especially important. The first one is system administration. Linux system administrators are crucial in managing and maintaining the servers. Their main goal is to ensure support of, for these Linux servers so that the application which run on them can work properly. They are always in demand across various industries, including tech companies, financial institutions, and government organization. Then comes the DevOps field. The DevOps field is fairly a new field in IT. DevOps engineer who work on improving the efficiency of the development and deployment process often require a deep understanding of Linux environment given that many DevOps tools are Linux based. So basically, if you don't know, DevOps is the combination of two words or two teams, development and operations. So ask yourself, who belong to operations team? Well, of course, system administrators who manage these servers and most likely the Linux administrators. Then cloud computing. Professionals specializing in cloud services like AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud often need a Linux skills as many cloud instances and services run on Linux. Then software development. Software developers working on application or services and they are running their services on Linux platform. They're interacting with Linux servers 
they need familiarity with Linux so they could manage or build their software compatible with uh, Linux operating system. All right. Then there are many job areas. There's job area like network administrator, database, cybersecurity, embedded system, IT support, web development, and many more. Linux proficiency is a valuable skill in the tech industry. And with the continuous adoption and development of Linux-based technology, the job market for Linux skills seems very promising. And the last thing I'm going to tell you before I wrap up this video, in my experience, I have over 22, 23 years of experience in Linux. I never had a problem where I had to worry about my job. I always advanced and leveled up in my career and my skill gave me a unique identification in every company. If you want to learn more about Linux, check out my best-selling course on Linux at udemy.com or you could go straight to my website utclsolutions.com and you will find the exact same course there. Hey folks, welcome to the section 2 of this Linux course and that is designing and setting up the lab. So there are a few things that we will cover in this section that will get us ready to have our Linux environment where we could log in and practice. So what exactly are we covering in this section? This section will include the lectures or videos as follow. The first one is we'll go over the system requirement. Meaning if you are following my course, then you got to have a system that meets the requirement to install Linux operating system on your already existing computer or laptop. So we'll go over it. Don't worry. It's not a huge requirement. Very simple. And I'm sure you have all the requirement. Then designing the lab. How are we going to design it? This is something I want you to be with me and understand how the environment is set up. Then we'll talk about downloading and installing the virtualization software. A virtualization software is a software that allows you to run a multiple operating systems on a same machine. And we will talk more about a virtualization software when we get to that video. Okay, once we have it downloaded and installed, then we move on to creating a virtual machine. And creating a virtual machine is actually from the Oracle software, the Oracle virtualization software. We'll go through how we could create a virtual machine so we could install the operating system. And that's what comes to the fifth video where we will go over downloading and installing a Linux operating system. So the virtual machine is created and then the fifth lecture will include the installation actually and configuration of Linux operating system. And that will give us, following all these lectures, will give us our lab environment. And then we could actually jump into our Linux machine, the lab environment, and run all those commands, the fun stuff, the technical stuff that we will learn later on one by one. All right, I'll see you in the next lecture. If you want to learn more about Linux, check out my best-selling course on Linux at udemy.com or you could go straight to my website utclsolutions.com and you will find the exact same course there. Hey beautiful people, alright in this video we will go over what are the system minimum requirement that is needed to complete this course and of course to complete this course you gotta have a lab environment that runs a Linux operating system. Our whole goal of this course is that you learn Linux and to learn Linux you gotta have Linux operating system running on your system. Alright so let's say you have a computer um, at home let's not say it because you gotta have a desktop or a laptop. Okay, now that lap laptop or desktop could either run a Windows operating system or it could be a Mac operating system. It really doesn't matter. 
my personal preference is Windows and I'm gonna show you all the installation throughout Windows okay so you have that I'm sure you have a desktop or laptop now the requirement comes in that you have to have at least 4 gig of RAM which is the memory on your computer and you gotta have at least one CPU which is a central processing unit or CPU processor then you gotta have at least a 20 gig of hard drive HDD stands for hard disk drive so check how much disk space you have and it should have at least 20 gig free space in order for you to install Linux operating system then it will be nice to have a network on your system if possible so these are the minimum requirement that you have but I'm sure in, in this era everybody has all that minimum requirement on your computer you're probably not gonna find a computer nowadays that has less than 4 gig of RAM alright now question is how can I check all that requirement all right now as I said I'm using Windows so I'm gonna show you how to check the requirement on your Windows machine all you have to do is press the Win key on your keyboard first and then type my computer and it will show up this PC so older computers would show up actually my computer but newer version of a Windows will show up this PC all right anyway you have this now right click on it and click properties okay now here are is the properties here are the properties of your system for me look at that install RAM is 32 gig I have a lot of memory so you got to make sure you have at least four here you got to have a, a processor right here I have Intel R core i5 CPU process it has a lot of power so of course I'm sure you have one CPU without a CPU <laughs> your computer is not gonna function anyway alright so we confirmed that that we have RAM and CPU now what about the disk space so let's close this and again click the win button on your keyboard and type file explorer and you will see right here comes a file explorer click on it and then go to your this PC and here you'll see you see this C drive this is where you will see how much disk space you have left I have total of 475 gig of, free, of, of space out of which 46 gig is free so I'm good because I need only 20 gig by the way I should spend some time and clean up because I am using a lot and I'm gonna be running out very soon all right anyway that's not the point the point is you got to have at least 20 gig and which you should confirm and of course the last thing that we have is network see make sure the computer that you're using has internet access that would be a lot easier for you if you do if not um, still okay uh, no no big issue so go through the system requirement and make sure you have this minimum system requirement to move forward if you want to learn more about Linux, check out my best-selling course on Linux at udemy.com or you could go straight to my website utclsolutions.com and you will find the exact same course there. In this video, we will go over the designing of the lab. So you have to know how are we going to get our Linux operating system installed so we could do all the practice on it. So before we install the Linux operating system, the question is, how are we going to install it where are we going to install it so that's the whole thing about designing the lab so let's start with your desktop or your laptop I'm sure you have a desktop and laptop and we have gone this previously that you have confirmed that you have the required resources okay beautiful now your desktop or laptop is probably either running Windows operating system or Mac operating system now on top of these operating systems you need to install a virtualization software again virtualization software allows you to create multiple operating system on your existing hardware so if you're running Windows 
operating system by Microsoft, then you could go with Oracle VirtualBox. You could also go with VMware Workstation, but the easier one that we're going to go through this uh, entire course is Oracle VirtualBox. Now, if you're using Mac operating system, then most likely if you have M1 chip, then your Oracle VirtualBox might not work. So then you will have to go with the software called UTM. You could get that to your Mac store and you could download it and that's a virtualization software. All right, assuming we have Windows machine and we are going to install virtualization software called Oracle VirtualBox. Now, once we have that, then in this environment, we are going to create a virtual machine, which is not a real physical machine. It's a virtual, a software type of machine. Once we create that virtual machine, then we will, of course, after downloading our Linux operating system, then we will install a Linux operating system on that virtual machine. Now you're probably wondering why do we have to have this virtual machine? Why can't we just simply install Linux operating system right directly on my computer? Well, if that's what you wanted to do, go right ahead. But then what will happen? You're going to have to lose your existing operating system that is running on your computer. And I'm sure a lot of you don't want to go that route. So. This is the route for those who wants to keep the existing operating system and then still on top of that, install Linux and practice Linux. So this is our lab. This is how it's going to look like. And in the next lectures, we're going to do is we're going to install the virtualization software, then create a virtual machine and then install our Linux operating system. All right. See you in the next video. If you want to learn more about Linux, check out my best-selling course on Linux at udemy.com or you could go straight to my website utclsolutions.com and you will find the exact same course there. Hey folks and welcome back. In this video, we are going to download and install Oracle VirtualBox software. So if you go through step by step, the very first step is of course we have to open up your internet browser and visit www.virtualbox.org. Then the next step is go to its download page and find where is the download page on the navigation bar and then you will see the most recent software that you could download. All right, once the software is downloaded, the next step is of course to execute it and go through the installation and configuration procedure of the software. Okay. Very simple and straightforward. So let's start up our in, um, browser. Now, of course, pick the browser of your choice. I'm going to go with uh, Google Chrome. So I'll go type Chrome. And here I will type it in www.oracle, sorry, virtualbox.org. And it will bring me to this page. Let me move this up. All right, this page will give you the welcome to virtualbox.org, some information about it. I want you to go to the navigation pane and right here, click on downloads. Okay, when you are on the download page, right here it says virtualbox 7.0.10 platform packages. Now, depending when you are watching this video, the version might have changed. So it doesn't really matter. If the version is changed to a higher version, all you have to do is download this virtual software, the most recent one. Okay, then which platform? Are you using Windows machine where you're going to be downloading this? Then yes, click on this one. Are you using Mac? Are you using other Linux distribution or Solaris distribution? So for us, in our case, we have a Windows machine, so we'll click on Windows host. Okay. Once you click on it, it will start the download. And of course, the download process is very fast. It has already downloaded, see right here. And it downloads to my desktop. Okay, so now, where is my desktop? So let's, let's go to my desktop. 
All right, right here on my desktop, you see this is the executable file that it has downloaded. Now go ahead and double click on it so it could start the installation procedure. All right, the first thing is, do you allow, do you want to allow this app to make changes to your device? Yes, of course, because we wanted to go through the installation. Okay, next step is, welcome to the Oracle VM VirtualBox version setup wizard the setup uh, wizard will install oracle vm and so on click next okay select the way you want features to be installed i want you to leave everything default now you could customize it depending on your requirement but again since we are doing it for the first time uh, and this is for our lab we're gonna leave everything as is and just simply click on next Warning, network interfaces. Installing the Oracle VM VirtualBox in networking feature will reset your network connection and temporarily disconnect you from the internet. Proceed with installation now. Now before you click yes, make sure you're not running any type of like uh, important downloads or, uh, or program in the background that will interrupt uh, the network connectivity. If it is, go stop it and then come back and then do click yes. But of course, again, this is a lab. We know and we are not running anything, so go ahead and click yes. Missing dependencies, Python core. If you're getting these messages, that's fine. It will install these dependencies as well, so click yes. All right, begin installation. Ready to install? Yes, go ahead and click yes or install. Okay, Oracle VM VirtualBox 7010. Please wait while the setup visit installs Oracle VM VirtualBox. This may take some time. Or of course, for me, it took literally like 15 seconds. All right, Oracle VM VirtualBox installation is complete. Click Finish, Start, Oracle VirtualBox. If it's checked, then it will start the program right away. So click Finish, and it will start the Oracle VirtualBox application right now. All right, let's see if it is running on our tray or our task manager. Yes, it is. See right here, it is running. Okay. So here it is, Oracle VM VirtualBox. This is how the Oracle VirtualBox after installation, the portal will look like. Now, this portal allows you to create a new virtual machines, add existing ones if you already have it, import it, export it, and all these features you could go through one by one and understand. But of course, our main focus of this course is not to learn the virtualization software, but to actually learn Linux. So I'm going to leave that little piece of learning with you. If you wanted to explore more, go through it and learn it. But for now, we'll stop here and we'll go to the next video. In the next video, we will go ahead and create a new virtual machine so that virtual machine can have Linux operating system on it for our lab environment so we could practice a Linux commands on it. If you want to learn more about Linux, check out my best selling course on Linux at udemy.com or you could go straight to my website utclsolutions.com and you will find the exact same course there. Hello everyone. In this video, I will show you how to create a virtual machine. Now, before we get into creating it, let's first understand what is a virtual machine. As per Wikipedia, a virtual machine, or in short, a VM, is the virtualization or emulation of a computer system. Virtual machines are based on computer architectures and provide the functionality of a physical computer. Now, let's put it in simple words. A virtual machine is a program on your computer that acts as if it were a completely separate computer. You can run different operating systems, software, and applications on that virtual machine while using your main computer as normal. It's like having a computer inside of your computer allowing you to do different things at the same time. It's just that simple. Now, one thing please do remember that a virtual machine is referred as a guest and the main computer where it runs on is called a host. So again, in this video, we are gonna go through starting up our Oracle VirtualBox application and we'll create a new virtual machine. 
Now think of creating a new virtual machines as if just like you, you are visioning HP or Dell um, manufacturer. They manufacture a computer and they, the, while it's going through the manufacture process, it goes through an assembly line where the technicians or people who are working at the assembly line are actually putting in CPU, the other person put in uh, memory, then uh, they add a hard disk, then they add network cards, the motherboard, and so on. They put the whole thing together and it becomes one computer. Now, just like that, that person, those people who are assembly on the assembly line, now you are now taking over that role and you're creating a virtual machine. So in this virtual machine creation, you have a, a computer, for example, and in that computer, you're going to actually, I mean, not actually, but virtually, you will be adding a CPU to it. You will be adding a memory, adding a hard disk, or you'll be adding a network card. And all of that will be done on the virtualization software. And think of yourself as an engineer who are putting all these things together. <laughs> all right. Now let's get the fun part begin. Now I'm going to start up my Oracle virtual box. I'll go into my programs and type Oracle VM virtual box and let's start it up. Okay, so this is the Oracle VM virtual box portal or application. And now we'll go ahead and click on new. And here we're going to type a Linux lab because we will be installing a Linux operating system. So it's better that we go with the similar name so we could recognize it easily. Then the folder, uh, this is a default folder of the Linux machine or this virtual machine where all the files will be saved. We'll leave that as is. The next one is ISO image. Now, if you have already downloaded the Linux ISO image, then you could go ahead and click on drop down and then select where is it downloaded. Now, since we do not have the downloaded image yet, which we will do in the next video, so we will leave that as is. Now, look at that. This uh, uh, Oracle Virtual Box is smart enough that it picked the type for you, Linux, because it recognized from the name uh, Linux that I am installing Linux operating system on it. So if you are uh, going to do, let's say, Windows, then you could, of course, change it if you want. Uh, here you have Microsoft Windows, and then you will select whatever the version of Windows. But now, of course, our main topic or focus is Linux. So we'll go ahead and select Linux. And we leave the version as, as the default version that it has selected as 64-bit. Okay, beautiful. Next one is unattended install. Now, if you wanted to install the Linux operating system unattended, then you will configure this part. But we are not doing that, so we will leave that as is. And then let's go to hardware. Hardware, here we have base memory, which is the RAM of your computer. Now, again, you are the person who are going to put in all these peripherals in that virtual machine. So we want 2 gig, so we will slide this to the right, so it will 1024 can become 2048, which is equal to 2 gig. Okay, processor, we just need one. That's perfectly fine. Now let's go to hard disk. Hard disk right here, create a virtual hard disk now. Yes, that's what we want. And the name of the hard disk will be the same name as the name of your VM, .vdi. Okay, leave that as default. The size it selected is 8. Let's change it to 2020 gig. Okay, now you're probably thinking, why am I going with 20 gig? Why not 40? Why not 60? Why not 8? Well, first of all, the version of Linux operating system we are going with, the latest one, requires at least 20 gig. Um, the older versions of Linux may be required lesser disk space, but um, this one requires at least 20. Now, you could go with higher if you want, if you have uh, more disk space and you're going to be doing a lot of work in the Linux machine. I don't mind. You could go with 40, 60, or even 100. Okay, knock yourself out. Okay, then the, this second option is use an existing virtual hard disk file. So if you already have had created a VM before and you wanted to attach its disk to this VM, you could do that by selecting this option. Now, if you do not want to create a virtual disk at all, 
then you could select this option. Uh, but of course, we do want to install operating system and it needs disk for it. So we will give, we'll go with the first option. All right, now go ahead and click finish. Okay, now you'll see this is the virtual machine we created and on the right hand side all the specification that we have in this configure in this virtual machine. General just give you the information about the name operating system. The system one gives you the memory of that we have assigned to this virtual uh, virtual machine. I also give you the information about the CPU and all that stuff. Then storage we pick 20 gig. It's right here. Audio leave a default. Network. So network right now is telling you that it's a NAT, which is only the communication between the, your virtual machine and your main host computer. We want this virtual machine to go out on the internet. So for that purpose, we will change it to, let's go to setting and go to network and from NAT to bridge adapter. This one will allow you to go to the internet. Now, of course, for this course, you don't need to go to the internet, that's fine. But if you want to, then you will change the bridge adapter. Otherwise, you could leave it as a NAT as it was. Okay, click OK. USB, leave a default, shared folder, description, leave everything as is. Now you have completed the virtual machine creation. Congratulations. All right, the next step is that we will download the Linux operating system ISO image and we will attach that ISO image to this uh, virtual machine so we could go through the installation. I'll see you in the next video. If you want to learn more about Linux, check out my best selling course on Linux at udemy.com or you could go straight to my website utclsolutions.com and you will find the exact same course there. In this video, we are going to download and install the Linux operating system. Yes, let the fun part begin. You're gonna learn how you could download and install the Linux on your own. Just follow my directions and you could do it many times after that. Okay, so what are the steps that we are doing? The first step is we are of course going to our internet browser and going to www.centos or centos.org. Make sure it's not .com, it's O-R-G. Then once we are there, we'll navigate to our download page and download the most recent Linux software, okay? And then we are going to do the install and configure Linux. Now, the reason I am going with CentOS or CentOS is because it's pretty much the exact replica of Red Hat Linux operating system. And Red Hat is, one of the biggest operating system that is used mostly on corporate world. So if you are going to go and work for a corporate company and supporting Linux as a system administrator, then I'm telling you nine out of 10, you will be dealing with Red Hat. So now since you're going to be dealing with Red Hat, so why not use the same Linux flavor that is same as Red Hat and we'll go with CentOS. Okay, now if you're thinking, hmm, why, why we are not going with Red Hat if it's popular? Why CentOS? Good question. Well, you could go with Red Hat, but you wouldn't have to pay for its subscription and support. So that's the reason if you don't want to pay, and since we're doing this all in the lab environment, that's why we are going with CentOS. Okay, let's go and do some real stuff. Okay, let's go to open up your browser of your choice and I'm gonna go with Chrome. Okay, let's go to www.centos.org. Okay, once you are there, then let, let me make this bigger. Okay, then there are two of them that you will see, CentOS Linux and CentOS Stream. Okay, S consistent management platform that suits a wide variety of deployment for some open source communities. It is a solid, predictable base to build upon. Then Stream continuously delivered distro that tracks just ahead of Red Hat Enterprise Linux development. Positions at midstream between Fedora, Linux, and so on. So as I said, we wanted to stay as close as to RHEL. So we'll go with the CentOS Stream. By the way, you could go with either one. It doesn't really matter. The end goal is that we learn Linux and learn all the command lines that it has to offer and manage it. 
So let's go with stream. Okay, here you have download page and CentOS stream. The latest version is right now is nine. So we'll go with nine. Again, if you are watching this, depending on which time, which month, which year you're watching, it could change. Uh, if the, the version changed, not to worry about it, just go with the latest one. So right now it's nine. So go ahead and click on X8664 architecture. And then it will start the download process. Now the download process is a little long because this is a big file it is almost like 7 to 10 gigabyte of file make sure your computer has that much space to download that file and depending where is it downloading it's going to download for me it's going to download on the desktop but for you it could download on your documents but anyway wherever it's download you're going to see the arrow right here that will tell you that the download is in progress the download can take anywhere from five minutes to even half an hour, depending on your network speed. So I am going to skip this part and I will come back when it, the download is completed. All right, so the ISO image for our CentOS has completely downloaded. It took some time, but it's okay. As I said before, the file size is close to 10 gigs, so it can take some time depending on your network, depending on the speed of your computer. All right, for me, it has downloaded the ISO image on my desktop right here. I have verified it. If it's downloading for you somewhere else, please go to that location and make sure it, it is there. Now, it's time to attach this ISO image to our virtual machine, the virtual machine that we created in the last lecture. Okay, so let me go back again and let's start up our Oracle virtual box. That's where our virtual machine is. Okay, so right here, Oracle VM virtual box. Let's click on it and wait for a start. Okay, Linux lab, that's our virtual machine. Go ahead and click start. Okay, right here on this side, this window actually shows you the progress of the virtual machine, what's going on, it's powering up and so on. Okay, so now we got our virtual machine here. Now click inside into this virtual machine and on your keyboard, press the up arrow key so it can select the first option, which is install CentOS Stream 9. Okay. So it is selected. Now, again, on the virtual machine on the right-hand side, it says auto capture keyboard. It's just the information. If you want to read up on the capture that your host key, you need a host key to release it and uncaptured. And your mouse is captured inside of this too. So see, if you click inside, you see your mouse is gone. If you want to recover your mouse, you have to hit the right control key, meaning the control key that is located on the right side of your keyboard hit that key and you will have your mouse back see it's back you could go ahead and close this little log dialog box okay let's click inside the window again and hit enter on the option where it says install santos stream 9. okay now it's loading the ISO image. It's bringing up all the files that it needs to complete the installation. While it's doing that, let's click the right control key again and minimize the one, the Oracle virtual box window behind it. Okay, it is minimized. Now this is the virtual machine that we have. This is just like as if you are using a regular computer. Now this is everything is going to be virtual from this point on. Okay, right here again, mouse integration is going to tell you everything that you need to know how mouse got integrated, how you could release your mouse. So it's just information purpose. If, if you wanted to release your mouse, once again, hit the right control key on your keyboard and you see your mouse is released. Okay, starting installer. So this a startup process can take anywhere 30 seconds to two minutes again depending on your computer so i'm going to wait and fast forward and come back when we have the welcome screen all right we got the welcome screen welcome to centa stream 9 select the language for me it's english and i live in united states so i have this automatically selected united states 
now go ahead let me just make this a little bigger right here all right now go ahead click continue okay after the continue we have some installation uh, configuration to do the first one is keyboard it is selected based on our region english united states you don't have to do anything here language support same thing english and united states time zone or time and date america's new york now i am in new york and that's how it picked the the time zone itself so this localization is perfect let's go to the software the software says installation source where are you getting the software installed it's local media meaning we have attached the iso image then software selection now you are installing linux operating system it comes with many add-on software that you could have it installed with your operating system or you could just have a simple plain uh, command line version what we will do we will leave it default where it says software selection server with gui meaning we do want the gui graphical user interface where you could see move your mouse and everything drag drop so we do want that just for experience but just remember 80 to 85 percent of the time i would say approximately corporate world do not use GUI so that's fine you log in and you will see the command line okay anyway coming back so if you want to change the selection and you if you want to select a different packages click on it and you will see all the different packages that are available depending on the requirement of your server if you're building the server for mail server you will select this one if this is going to be a DNS server you install this package and so on all right let's go ahead and click done all right, so I didn't change anything, but still it will go through to make sure if I have selected anything or not. Okay, coming to the system side, installation destination. Where are you installing this Linux operating system? Select that. Remember, we carved out 20 gig of disk space. That's what it has selected. It's just confirming. Now, right here says storage configuration. I wanted to do everything automatic, meaning all the partitions of the disk will be done automatically. If I wanted to change the partition to custom, meaning, for example, I'm installing Oracle and I wanted to give a dedicated uh, partition or a space to Oracle, then I have to go through the custom configuration so i'm not doing that we're keeping it simple and straightforward and just simply go ahead and click done you don't have to click anywhere else just done to confirm that you have selected that 20 gig k dump is a kernel dump if something goes wrong with your system do you want to see the kernel logs where it will throw out um, everything that happened to it it is enabled by default so you leave it as is network and host name okay so network meaning you do you want to configure the network you want it to go to the internet or not and host name is the operating system name this is not the name of the virtual machine which is we we did linux lab this is the name or host name of that operating system so let's click on it and when you come here uh, by default, it has selected the Ethernet port, the NIC port for us, and it says connected, and it is turned on. And you will see it has default gateway IP address. Now, depending on your ISP provider, your Internet provider, your default gateway a router IP is different than mine, but you got to have an IP here. So anyway, it's telling me it's connected. Everything looks good. Beautiful. Now I need to give it a host name. So we will give a host name Linux Cent OS. Simple. It's uh, Linux and Cent OS is the flavor. That's pretty much it. And I want to click apply. As soon as I click apply, you see right here, it says current local, current host name is localhost. So it doesn't have any name. So as soon as I click apply, this is going to change. Current host name, Linux CentOS. All right, beautiful. We are doing great together. And now go ahead and click done. Okay, 
Security profile, if you are working for a company and they have certain security that you want to apply, uh, you could get that security configuration from your administrator and you could apply here. But for now, if you want to configure yourself, you could do that as well. But again, we will keep it very simple and straightforward since this is our lab environment. So we will leave it as is. Now coming down to the user setting, root password. Root is the most powerful account of your Linux operating system. It is just like in Windows, you have an administrator account, right? That's uh, like a super user account. That's the same way in Linux, there is a root account that is very powerful. So we will give it a password, okay? So password, make sure the password is powerful or strong, okay? Right here, I give it a password and it says the password fails the dictionary check. It is based on a dictionary word. It will ha You will have to press done twice to confirm, meaning it, it actually recognized the password that I entered is weak. But in order for, for it to take that, I have to press done twice. Okay, before I do that, uh, lock root, root account. No, I don't want to lock. Allow root SSH login with password. Yes, I want root account to log in with SSH as well, meaning remotely if I have to. Click done one time and click done again. But of course, I would recommend that you pick a strong one. But if you are setting this up for your lab, it doesn't really matter. User creation. Now you have defined the root password. Now it's time to create a user for yourself or others who you think are going to be logging into this computer. By the way, Linux is a multi-user environment where it runs in a corporate world and in corporate, you probably see at least 10 to 100 accounts on just one single machine. All right, full name. I'm, I'm going to put in my name as an example, Imran Afzal, and automatically it's going to shorten down to username iAfzal. Make this user administrator. That's fine. If I need to get administrative access, root access, I'll log in as root. Require a password to use this account? Yes, of course. So let's define the password. Okay, same thing. I'm picking weak password and therefore I have to click done twice. One, two. Okay. Excellent. Look at that. Beautiful. We did all the configuration and we do not see any yellow or red flag here. Okay. Now click on the magic wand, which is begin installation. Okay. The installation again can take anywhere from five minutes to all the way 30 minutes or a little more if I, if I'm, if I'm correct. Because it depends, again, the speed of your computer, the main computer. So I am going to wait, fast forward this entire process. And once the installation is completely done, then I'll come back. Okay, folks, so the installation has been successfully completed. Use of this product is subject to license agreement found in this, uh, uh, this location. Okay, so that's fine. Click on System Reboot. Okay, so we have our operating system up. And now I see my user account that I created during the installation. Go ahead and click on this. If you want to log in as root, then you go click on not listed, put in the username root and the password that you actually uh, defined during the installation. Okay, so we already have our account. We'll go with our own account and go ahead and enter the password.
Okay, now you have a desktop environment of your Linux operating system. Now it says, welcome to CentOS Stream. You want to take a tour. If you want to, it will show you certain different things that you have probably never seen. So maybe it's worth taking the tour. I have seen it many times, so I'm going to say no thanks. And now this is your desktop environment. So you could click here and it will show up the desktop environment. You could go to activities and you will find all these application files, software, all that you could access from right here at the bottom. Now, most of the time, Linux is managed through the command line. And that's what we will do throughout this course is that we will manage our Linux operating system to the command line. So where is that command line? The command line is something that you get it from the terminal. So you click on the terminal and it will open up a terminal window. Here it is. You see this blinking cursor? This is your terminal where you will type everything as a command line. Right here at the beginning, you see this is I of Zal. This is what it tells you that you are logged in as I of Zal. At which system you're logged in? This is a Linux CentOS. This is the host name that we defined during our installation configuration. Right here is the prompt. The dollar prompt mostly refers to that you are logged in as a regular user. If you log in as root user, then this prompt will change it to hashtag or the pound sign. Okay, so this is your terminal. Once again, congratulations to you. You have your Linux environment set up. In this environment, we're going to have a lot of fun together. We're going to run commands and we're going to learn so many things together. If you want to learn more about Linux, check out my best-selling course on Linux at udemy.com or you could go straight to my website utclsolutions.com and you will find the exact same course there. In this video, we are going to learn how can we access our Linux operating system or machine which is running a Linux operating system. Okay, there are two ways to access your Linux operating system. One is through the console access, meaning you start up your virtualization software, you start up your virtual machine, and then you could simply log in by clicking inside the window, and that's what called console access. For this console access, you don't need any network access or remote access, just a straight access. Now, this console access is, of course, for the virtual machine where you could start it up. Now, if you have a physical machine where you have installed Linux operating system directly on that physical machine, then it's the same way. The only difference is you will have to connect monitor and keyboard directly to that physical computer, wherever it is located, whether it's located in your office or if it's in a data center or it's racked in a shelf, you would have to go with your monitor, keyboard, and mouse and directly connect to the server and that's your console access to the physical machine. Again, this does not require any internet or remote access to your Linux machine. Okay, th so that's one way. The second way is a remote access over SSH, meaning you do need an IP address of your Linux machine and that Linux machine has to be on the network, meaning that you could access that IP address and then you could connect to that IP address. Now, in order to connect to a Linux machine over an IP address, you would need a protocol called SSH, which is in short for Secure Shell. Now, Secure Shell is available if you have another Linux machine, you could use that to connect to a different Linux machine. If you do not have another Linux machine, and let's say you have a Windows machine, and you want to connect from your Windows machine to your Linux machine, then you need some kind of software. And that software is called PuTTY. The PuTTY software allows you to connect from a Windows machine to a Linux machine over Internet. And you have to provide the IP address of it. Okay, so 
let's really quickly go over the console access. So I have my Oracle virtual box right here. And this is right here. This is what I'm talking about. This is the first way of accessing Linux, meaning over console. This is the virtual machine and this is the console. I click inside and I hit enter and I put in my password. Okay, do you see right here? This is my console access. Same way if you had a physical machine, then you would directly plug into the computer and you will get the similar console on your screen. Okay, so that's one way. The second way, as I said, you will have to connect over SSH over the network now, anything you connect over the network, that that destination, you got to have its IP address. Now, you want to connect to this Linux machine, right? So you need to find out what is the IP address of this machine. And for that, you will run a command if config. And when you run it, you will see right here, this is your network uh, adapter. And this is the IP address that you need. Now again, your IP address is probably different from mine depending on your router, depending on your ISP. So for me, it's 10.0.0.78. Okay, so now you need to copy this IP and then you need to input that IP to your PuTTY client if you're using, if you wanted to connect over the Windows. So here's a PuTTY client. Now where do you get the PuTTY client? Great question. Let's download the putty now that you could download the putty by going to of course your internet browser and you could type download putty go here download putty click on it and you see right here it says download putty you could click on this and go through the installation now I already have my putty downloaded and installed so what I'll do is I'll go here I think I do <laughs> Yes, I do. All right, I'll go here. See, this is my putty. It says application putty. I'm going to click on it. And this window, this is a very tiny little software that allows you to connect to your Linux machine over the internet. Okay, see it's asking host name or IP address. So if you remember, what was my IP address? It was 10.0.0.78. 10 .0 that was it. Now click open. And it will ask you the host key is not cached for this server because I'm trying to connect for the first time. You could go ahead and click accept. Beautiful. See, this is the login screen I have for my Linux machine. And if I type it in, it's asking log in as. I created my account. Remember, username was iafzal. Hit enter. And the password that I picked during the installation and then hit enter. Excellent. See, I got the pro command prompt. I have Zal is a username, and this is the host name that we defined during the installation, Linux CentOS. And this is the second way or second method of accessing your Linux machine. So now you know both ways to access your Linux machine. Now, for those of you who do not have internet access or network access on your Linux machine, then you're not gonna be able to access over remotely. So that's fine. You don't have to because this course doesn't require you to go and have internet access. Everything we will do, we will do over our console, which is this. This is the one, we'll go to our Oracle virtual box, we will start up our virtual machine and we will have a direct access to our terminal right from this console all right i hope now you learned something new i'll see you in the next video if you want to learn more about linux check out my best-selling course on linux at udemy.com or you could go straight to my website utclsolutions.com and you will find the exact same course there Hey folks, and welcome to section three of this course. And that is Linux basic administration. This is the section where I will actually teach you what are the commands you need to run in order to manage your Linux system. 
Okay, let's go over the things one by one that we will cover in this entire section. The first one is we will cover what is Linux file system. Now, of course, we, we will go into running the commands and managing the files and those files are associated with a file system. So before we get into it, we need to understand what really a file system is. Then a file system structure and description in Linux. Then we'll go into files and directory pro properties, meaning what are the properties or metadata that are associated with each file and directory in Linux. Then we'll get into the actual commands. That's where we will learn the Linux navigation commands. The first three, the primary, the prominent uh, commands. Without these three commands, you cannot go anywhere in Linux. And that is CD, LS, and PWD. Then we are going into the Linux file management commands. Uh, these are the commands you would need to manage all the files and directories in your Linux system. And those commands are touch, copy, remove, move, make directory. And if you made it, you need to remove it as well. So <laughs> remove directory. And then the last topic we'll cover in Linux basic administration is how can you view the content of a file? Well, the commands that you could use to view is, is cat, more, head, tail, and vim editor. So these are the few topics, but these topics can take some time. We'll go over it, each command one by one, and make sure that you learn everything about these commands. And you could freely run this command anytime when you log into the Linux system. All right, I'll see you in the very first video of this section. If you want to learn more about Linux, check out my best-selling course on Linux at udemy.com or you could go straight to my website utclsolutions.com and you will find the exact same course there. In this video, we will learn a Linux file system and more specifically, just a file system. So as per Wikipedia, a file system is a method and data structure that the operating system uses to control how data is stored and retrieved. Now, without a file system, data placed in a storage medium would be one large body of data with no way to tell where one piece of data stopped and the next began, or where any piece of data was located when it was time to retrieve it. Okay, let's put that in simple words. File system is a system to manage and organize files and directories in an operating system. So it can be retrieved easily and fast. Just that simple. Okay. In Windows, the file systems that they have, they named it as FAT32 and the newer one is NTFS. Now in Linux, there is ext3, ext4, xfs, btrfs. In macOS, it is Apple File System, hfs, or ufs, or there are a few others as well. Now you're probably thinking why there are different file systems in different operating systems. Well, that's a great question. I'll answer you right after this slide so and this slide is about talking why do we need a file system okay now think of file system as a library so you go to a library that is closest to your house for example and one thing of course in every library you notice that they have sections for each book for example if you want a sci-fi books you'll go to one section and they keep it in that shelf or in that section. Similarly, for humor, you go to another shelf. Adventure has other shelf. True stories, drama, love stories, fiction, kids. See, there are so many different categories of books and all those books are actually shelved or placed based on its categories. Now, 
because of this organization, it becomes so easy to retrieve a book. Let's say if you're looking for a book on a drama, you could go to the drama section and go retrieve that book right away. Now think of this shelf that is very unorganized. There is no label, no categorization, and you have this shelf full of books. You place this adventure books here, true stories there, kids books here, fictional there, humor there, adventure there. It's all over the place. Now you go back to your shelf and you want to pull a book that is based on, for example, adventure. Now you tell me, is it going to take you a lot faster than being an organized way of library or a lot longer? Of course, a lot longer, right? Because now you don't have an organized way of putting all these books together. That's why the file system is based on the same phenomena. So where files are put in it to different folders that it belongs to its same category. Now, going back to the question is why do we have a different file systems for different operating system is because let's say, you know, it's, it's the same, it's the same way of doing things, meaning categorizing it, but maybe Apple said, I'm going to move the humor to the bottom shelf. I'm going to, and, and a window says, I'm going to move the drama category to the top shelf. It's just the way of shifting few things around, but the core purpose is the same is to organize your files in a way so it could be retrieved a lot faster. Now let's look at this example. Here we have these four files in Linux and these files has to go to, or these files have to go to their, their folder they belong to. So let's say right here on the very top one, we have a configuration file. So where we do the installation and uh, then we do a configuration of a software, it creates that configuration file. So it belongs to a certain folder. So where does it belong to on the right hand side? Of course, this belongs to on this folder. Then we have log files, which keeps track of how your system changes. So it goes to the log folder. Then you have a user file, which is my name file, for example, I have Zal. Where does it go? It goes to the user folder. And then you have initialization file, which initializes your file system, sorry, which initializes your operating system. And that goes to where? Yes, it goes to the boot folder. See, that's the way operating system, or now in specific Linux operating system, organizes its file to its own folders. So this way, it will be a lot easier for users as well to pull those files. So let's say if you wanted to change some configuration of an application, you don't have to go around look for config files. You could just go straight to the config folder or directory and find your file and make changes. And that's why life becomes so easy in an operating system when we have a file system. Beautiful. If you want to learn more about Linux, check out my best-selling course on Linux at udemy.com or you could go straight to my website utclsolutions.com and you will find the exact same course there. Linux file system structure and description. This is the video where we will talk about how Linux has a different folder or directory structure and what is the purpose of each directory. By the way, a folder in Linux is called a directory and that's what it is mostly referred to as. In Windows, it is referred to as a folder. Okay, so the very first folder or a directory in Linux is always starts with slash. It's a forward slash and from this point on, all the other subdirectories start. I am going through all of these uh, subdirectories within the very first main directory. And of course, I'm not covering every single one of them, but I'm covering only the prominent ones. By the way, going back to the very first directory, this first, very first slash directory is often referred to as slash or root directory or the core of the, of the file system. Okay. The very first directory after slash 
is etc directory. This is a directory that contains configuration files for system services and applications. So if you install an application in your Linux system, for example, you install Apache or you install any other application like DNS, all its configuration file will most likely be saved in slash etsy directory. Then we have another directory called slash war. It contains variable data that changes frequently. And therefore, the files such as log files and mail spool files are the files that reside in this directory. Then the next one is slash bin directory. The bin directory contains essential system binaries such as the shell and common utilities. Of course, there is another directory that is slash sbin, which also have a lot of Linux utilities or commands. Then there is another directory slash home. And this one contains the home directories of all users on the system. So if I create a user account on Linux system, that user account home directory will most likely be created in slash home. Okay, then uh, there is slash boot directory. This directory contains the boot loader and kernel files. Every time the Linux operating starts up, it will go into this directory first to find out how I am going to start up this operating system or what is the kernel to start up with. The next one is slash dev directory. Now this directory contains de device files, which represents physical devices on the system, such as hard drives, printers, and network interfaces. So all of these that are, all of, all of the external devices that are attached to your computer, those are actually shown to be as a file inside of slash dev directory. Now if you notice, Every directory that I'm going through, all of them start with slash and then the name because the very first directory is slash directory, root directory. Okay, next one is slash root. This is the home directory of the user root account, which is the most powerful account in Linux. And the last one is slash temp directory. This is the temporary directory for storing files that are not needed after the system reboot. Again, as I said, there are more directories, but I'm only covering the most prominent ones. Now, also these subdirectories have sub subdirectories as well. For example, the slash var has another directory called slash log. Similarly, slash home directory has another subdirectory of my user home directory called slash ifzol and so on. Every directory that you see will have a sub or sub or sub directories within its directory. So that's what I wanted to cover in this lecture. So you have a good understanding how the Linux file system is structured, why it's structured, and what is the purpose of each directory in a Linux file system. If you want to learn more about Linux, check out my best-selling course on Linux at udemy.com or you could go straight to my website utclsolutions.com and you will find the exact same course there. In this video, we are going to cover file and directory properties, meaning what are the associated metadata of a file or a directory in Linux operating system. So. A Linux file or a directory has nine properties or metadata. One, the first one is type and permission, number of links, who owns that file or directory, which group owns that, the size of it, month it was created, the date it was created, and even time, and then the file or directory name itself. Okay, so how can we find that information about a file or a directory? So, there is a command that you run 
to get that information about a file or directory. And the very first command that we will learn, uh, by the way, in the following lecture, and that is ls, and it is short for list. And the minus l that you see after the space, it's the option that needed to be there in order to see a file or directory properties. If you just type simply ls, it will only list the files and directories names and nothing else. So assuming we are running this command and we will get the list like this. So if, if you notice, there are four, sorry, there are nine different fields and I have color coded all of these fields. So this way it's easier for you to see that every field is different and you could actually count them their total nine. So you will get this output when you run ls minus l command and if there are multiple files or multiple directories in that directory where you are, you're going to get the entire list of every directory and every file. Okay, I don't want to confuse you more, so I just wanted to tell you what each field actually means. So the very first field is the permission field right here, but the very first bit of that permission field actually tells you the type of file, whether this is an actual regular text file, is it a directory? If it is, then you will see a D right here, a lowercase d. Is it a link? If it is a link, then you will see L here. Is it um, a, a device or socket file? So there are many different type of files. So this very first bit, by the way, that's what it is referred to as the bit is the one that tells you what type of file it is. Okay, after the first bit, you see this entire field has read, write, dash, read, dash, dash, read, dash, dash. So this entire value that you see, it's the value that defines the permission of that file or directory. And by the way, what exactly this read, write, and execute, by the way, it's not there. There's also one execution that is used for any a scripting file or if it's a script or, or, or anything that's can execute. By the way, this permission thing we will cover later on. But for now, you need to know that the first column is for the permission. The second column actually tells you how many number of hard links are associated with that directory or file. If it's a file, you're going to see just one itself. That's it. But you're not going to be using this second column information as much in, in the entire Linux administration. Then the third column is about the owner. Who owns that file or who created that file? So I create this file, for example, and then I will see my name as username who owns this file. Then the fourth column is about group. Which group owns that file? So I belong, which is I of Zal as a user belongs to a group called local. So that's why the my file that you see, which is by the way, the right end, the end of this is the name of the file. That's where it tells you it belongs to the local as a group. Then this one is the size of the file, how much the bytes of the file it has. Then this is the month, date, time, and then of course the actual name of the file or the directory. So these are the nine fields that are associated with any file or a directory of a Linux operating system. All right, so what I'll do right now is I will log into our Linux system, yes, and we will run this command, and by running it, we'll see the output, and you will see that entire value that you see right on the screen, that entire output on the screen. All right, so, I have my Linux machine open already, and here I am on the login screen, so I'm gonna click on my name. I am going to enter the password. Okay, once I'm logged in, go ahead and click on this little 
um, that looks like a terminal or a screen and that is a terminal click on it and it will open a command line terminal by the way this entire space that you see it's a desktop just like as if you're logging into a Windows computer where you see the entire desktop but our focus is not working with the desktop our focus is to work with the command line so here is the command line every anything that we will do in this entire course we will do it on this terminal and we'll run command okay right now I am logged in as I have saw right here you could see I logged in as I have saw and the computer or Linux machine that I'm logged in is its host name is Linux sent OS that's the name we gave when we built the system okay now if I run the command ls minus l this is going to list every file or directory in my directory that I am in okay and you see right here this is what I'm talking about in this entire lecture the very first field right here tells you the permission and this very first bit right here is a D which means this is a directory all right then this uh, these are the permission of that directory meaning the owner can read write and execute then the group can read and execute only and all the others can read and execute by the way these are the permissions and I'll go into detail about these permission later on when we will talk about security and permissions of files okay that's the entire first column then the second column is about the number of hard links the third column is about who owns this file or directory again who which group owns it so I have my own group that group name is same as my username which is I have Zal. this is the size of the directory the month the date the time and the actual name of that directory now if I create a file and to create a file I could run a command for example touch ABC and what is a touch command not to worry about right now I will cover that as well later on when you run touch ABC this is going to create a new file and now if you run LS minus L you'll see this is giving me this file information ABC and since it is just a text file that is why there is no D in front of it it is not a directory and it tells you all the properties of that file that we just created excellent so this is what I wanted to talk to you about in this entire lecture where the file and directories properties you should be able to identify what are the properties associated with a file or a directory if you want to learn more about Linux check out my best-selling course on Linux at udemy.com or you could go straight to my website utclsolutions.com and you will find the exact same course there hey folks in this video we are going to cover Linux navigation commands now these navigation commands are the main core commands that you need in order to navigate Linux file system meaning in order to get to a file in order to get into a directory you need these commands and the these are the three main Linux navigation commands that I'm going to cover the first one is LS which is in short for list and it has a different options that you could use depending on what you are looking for we'll cover each option one by one then there is the second command PWD which is in short for print working directory and it has a very few options. one of the options is if you want to know which directory you are in or if you want to find out the path for a specific directory you could run that command followed by that path directory then there is a CD command CD command in short is, stands for change directory and the only option that you could use with it is the CD dot dot which would allow you to move one directory backward 
Anyway, don't confuse yourself with the options right now. Now, you're probably thinking, why do I need these navigation commands? Uh, well, that's a great question because in Windows, I'm going to compare it with Windows so you will know exactly what I'm talking about. So in Windows, when you start up your operating system, you have a, a GUI desktop, right? Everything is uh, a graphical way of controlling. You have your mouse, you have a keyboard, and you click on a folder, which is in Linux a directory. You double click on it and you get inside of that folder. And then you see what's inside of that folder or directory is. You will see more directories, you will see more files and so on. Now in Linux, as I said, mostly Linux is all command line in corporate world. In Linux, you don't really have a desktop type of environment or it's not installed in corporate servers. So you have to use command lines. So in command line, you will use these commands to actually list what's inside of a directory to do PWD to see where exactly you are. And if you wanted to go from one directory to another directory, you'll use the CD command. Okay, I'm going to log into my Linux machine, uh, my virtual machine, which I have already opened. And if you don't have it, you could start up your Oracle virtual box, then select your virtual machine and click on start. So I already have started and it is right here. And let me log in. I have logged in as myself. I'm going to put in the password. Sorry. Okay. No, password did not work. Maybe I fat fingered. Okay. I got it in after providing the correct password. Okay. Uh, when you log in for the first time, you're not going to get this terminal again. You could get the terminal. Uh, when, when you, as soon as you log in, you will see a little window at the bottom that says terminal. You click on it and you will see it. If you don't see it, you could click on here terminal and it will open up this terminal. And by the way, again, as I said previously, this is your desktop environment. Um, usually you don't get that in corporate world. You get a command line and think of it. This is your command line and this is the only thing you will get and you have to work through it. Now, as soon as you get in, now, how do you know where are all those files or directories? All you see is the blinking cursor right here. So you run the command ls, which is to list and hit enter. And this is going to output all the directories and all the files inside of your directory that you are currently in. Okay. And what are the options that are available? As I said, the option is minus L, minus A, and minus H, meaning minus L will list all the files and directories along with all the properties. LS minus A, sorry, hyphen A or minus A will list all the files and directories and the hidden files and directories as well. So all the hidden files in Linux always start with dot. You could also combine um, the options as well. For example, ls minus la, these are the two combination of the option l and a, which will list the files as well as list the hidden files. So here, the output, which is telling you all the properties associated with each file and directory and all the hidden files as well. Then we have another uh, option, which is minus H. So that will tell us the human readable size. LS minus LH, right here, the human readable size of the files that or the directories we have inside of this directory. Okay, now I'm keep saying inside of this directory or where, I'm, where am I in. Now, how do I find out which directory I am in right now? That's a great question. And for that, we have another command, print working directory, PWD, and hit enter. And it will tell you I am in slash, which is the very first directory or called slash the very root directory. Within that, there is a home directory. Then within that, there is a slash I absolve directory. So here is a complete path and directory that I am in. 
perfect. Now, what if I wanted to go inside of a directory? Right now, first you need to find out whether if I wanted to get into the desktop directory, then first thing I need to make sure that this desktop is a directory by looking at right here that the type is D. Perfect. So as long as there it is labeled as D, I could use a command CD space desktop. Okay, here's something that will happen and I want you to pay close attention. Right here it says CD desktop no such file or directory. Why? It is there. Well, the reason it is throwing this error message is because that this desktop has a D in uppercase. So in Linux, uppercase and lowercase matters a lot. It's not like Windows where it does not matter. So if it is in uppercase, you have to type it in uppercase D as exactly as it's showing up. Now hit enter. See, as soon as you hit enter, you get your prompt back. Now, how do you know which directory you are in? Again, you could do PWD and that will tell you now you are in slash home, I have Zol, and desktop directory right here. Okay, I am in desktop directory. Now, what are the files and directories are inside of desktop directory? Excellent question. What command you will run? LS minus L. Right now, there is nothing in there. Is there any hidden one? LS minus LA. Nope, there are no, sorry, I did LA minus LA. <laughs> LS minus LA. And nope, there are no hidden directories either. So this desktop uh, that I have is basically by the this desktop, meaning this is the desktop that you see here. Do you see any file or directory right here? No, right? That's why there is no file or directory inside of the desktop directory. So these are the three commands I want you to learn. LS is to list what's inside of a directory. PWD is to find out which directory you are in. And CD if you want to change the directory. Now I want to compare this with Windows and you will know exactly what I'm talking about. So I want you to go to, um, sorry, not here. I want you to go to your search and type file explorer. Right here is your file explorer. And here, go to your, this PC. And in this PC, I want you to go to your C drive. And inside the C drive, you notice you have all these folders. And in Windows, these are called folders. And in Linux, these are called directories. Exactly. Now, what if you want to go to, let's say, this folder, users? What do you do? You do click, click. A double click see right here you get in and you see all these folders that are inside of users folder now how do I do the same function in Linux in Linux you have to do CD and that will get you in okay now which directory you are in in Linux you have to run the command PWD but why do which is that equate to in Windows when in Windows you don't have to do that because as soon as you get into these it will tell you right up here this is your path this PC Windows and users beautiful now what if I go another directory let's say in my Imran directory right and you see inside of this directory there are so many files and so many folders or directories are as well now, why do I need ls command? Because as soon as I get into this Imran directory, you see Windows automatically showing you everything it has. But in Linux, it does not show you what it has. That is why you run ls command to see what's inside of that directory. Okay, that's the comparison I could give you that there is ls command to list files and directory in Linux, pw to tell you which path are you in which is right here and cd if you want to get inside of a directory or a directory or in more directories for example i want to get into vms double click on it and it will take me to another subfolder if i wanted to go back from this to an to a, another directory or to the directory that was previously i was in you could do this back to go back, you could do back again to go back. Beautiful. 
it's so easy in Windows, but how do I do in Linux? In Linux, right now you are in slash home slash ifsol slash desktop, right? Now, if you wanted to go back one directory, you would do cd dot dot and hit enter. And which directory now you are in? See, now you are in slash home slash ifsol. You are out of desktop. These are the commands you really need throughout managing your operating system in Linux. If you want to learn more about Linux, check out my best-selling course on Linux at udemy.com or you could go straight to my website utclsolutions.com and you will find the exact same course there. Hey folks, in this video and a few other videos following this video, we are going to learn Linux file management commands. File management commands allow you to manage files and directories such as creating a new file, adding contents to a new file or to an existing file, copying a file, removing a file, and moving a file. And by the way, the command that will be used to move a file can also be used to rename a file. So as I said, we will be we will be covering all of them one by one in the later videos. All right, so the very first command that we will learn in our Linux file management command is creating a new file, and that is the touch command. The touch command in Linux is used to create new empty file or to change the access and modification times of an existing file. The basic syntax of the touch command is touch followed by the file name. Or it looks like something like touch space big data. And in my case, I am going to name the file big data. Okay, so when you run this command, the above command will create a new file called big data if it does not exist. Okay. Let's log into our Linux system and practice touch command. I have already started the Oracle virtual box and I have started up my Linux virtual machine. Okay, so let me go ahead and bring that up. All right, it is here, it is open. My terminal to the Linux machine is already open. If you don't have it open, you could click on here to start the terminal. Okay, so if you run, if you want to create a file let's say big data you could run the command touch big data right so let's right now let's see which directory i am in pwd i am in slash home slash i have solved what are the files and directories in my home directory which is home i have solved so do ls minus ltr and you will see all these directories that starts with d and also have a blue color are the directories and this one that does not start with D is a file ABC and by the way don't focus too much on the color because a lot of times you're gonna log in through a different session and it will not show you the color so it's best that you identify a file and a directory by its first bit in the permission okay Anyway, so these are the existing files and directories. Now, if I wanted to create a new file called big data, I will just simply run the command touch big data and hit enter. Now, is that file created? We don't know until we run the command ls minus ltr or minus l. The reason I run ltr is because l will give me the list of all files in alphabetical order. And if I put L with the T, then it will give me all the files and the most recent file that is created on top. And if I do R, then it will give me everything in reverse order in the time. So that's what the command I'm used to. You could use any option you like. Okay, hit enter and you'll see the most recent file that has been created by the timestamp is showing up all the way at the bottom. Okay, you see I have created this file big data and it is empty file because it has zero bytes. So that's how you create a file using a touch command. Now, 
you could also modify the the modification time of an existing file for example this file abc i created on october 4th 1621 and if i wanted to give it or modify its timestamp by the way this will not modify the content inside of the file it will only modify the the timestamp okay so i'll do touch abc hit enter and let's see if it has modified it or not by running ls minus ltr command and you see right here now it's changed to october 20th which is today's date and today's time which is different from this right here october 4th right okay very good so that's the purpose of creating or, or, or that's the purpose of a touch command is to create a new file or to modify the time of an existing file i will see you in the next video where we will cover another linux file management command if you want to learn more about linux check out my best selling course on linux at udemy.com or you could go straight to my website, utclsolutions.com, and you will find the exact same course there. Hello. In this lesson, we are going to learn additional Linux file management commands, and those are mkdir and rmdir commands. The mkdir, or make dir command in Linux, is used to create new directories or folders. The name make dir stands for make directory okay the second command is the rmdir or rmdir command is for deleting a directory of course in order to delete a directory a directory has to exist the basic syntax of the make dir and rmdir command is make dir followed by the name of the directory and to delete it simply rmdir followed by the name of the directory okay so in order to create a new directory for example data dir you run the command mkdir followed by data dir and to remove that same directory you will do rmdir space data dir or you could also use another command rm which we will learn later on to delete a directory with minus r option or hyphen r options okay let's look at the options that these commands come with the first one is minus p the p option when specified it creates parent directories as needed this is useful for creating a nested directory structure in a single command if the directories exist this option prevents any error messages. For example, when you run mkdir space minus p option, and let's say specify slash temp, which is a directory, then slash logs and slash big dir, then it will create big dir directory in temp log directory. Now, if the log directory does not exist, then with having this minus p option, will also create logs directory and then creates big dir directory. Okay, then the next option is minus m. This option is to set the file permissions of a new directory that you're creating. For example, let's say if you wanted to set a permission of a data dir directory to 700, then you run the command mkdir minus m with the permission octal numbers followed by the name of the directory okay let's log in and practice make dir and rm dir commands all right i started up my oracle virtual box already and then powered on my linux virtual machine okay i have it open right here Okay, so the very first thing, as I always tell you, is make sure which direct or which user are you logged in as. And in order to do that, you can run the command who am I? And it tells you you're logged in as I absolve. 
Okay, then you could ask which directory am I in? And that is print working directory PWD and it'll tell you you are in slash home slash IFSL. Very good. Now, if you wanted to know what are the files and directories inside of this directory that I'm in, that you could do ls minus l or ltr, whichever option that suits you, and you run the command, it will tell you the files and directories that are inside of this directory. Okay, now let's start creating a directory, and the name of the directory we want is the data dir. So you will do mkdir space data dir data dir and hit enter and if you get the prompt back meaning it works and how do you verify it works that you do ls minus l and you will see that data dir is right here now a lot of times i like to run the command ls minus ltr so i would know the most recent file or directory that is created it shows up all the way at the bottom so i'll run ls minus ltr which is L for listing in alphabetical order, T for time, and R for reverse order, meaning show me the latest one at the bottom. When you run this, you'll see the data dir is right here and it's showing up at the bottom of the listing. Okay, very good. Now let's start talking about removing the directory. So if I wanted to remove data dir, I could just simply do RMDIR data dir and it's gone because we got the prompt back, no error message, and we could verify by running the command ls minus ltr, and you see it's not there anymore. Okay, very good. Now let's recreate that date that data dir mkdir data dir. Let's verify it has been recreated. Yes, it has. Now we could run, we could delete the same directory by rm minus r data dir. As I said, rm is another command that we will learn later on. Um, and you could use the same command with minus r option, which I, which tells the command or indicates the command that it's a directory. So you hit enter. You got your prompt back, which means it worked without any error message. You could verify by running ls minus ltr, and you'll see the data dir is gone. Excellent. Now let's move to the option and see what are the options that it is talking about. Minus P option, as I said, if you want to create logs, big dir in temp directory, you could run make dir with minus P option. So let's move this a little to the side. So let's say if I go to CD slash temp directory, inside of that temp directory, do we have logs directory? Let's see, do ls minus L and pwd which i'm slash temp and when i did ls minus l it does not have any log directory it has these directories other directories and files and so forth so i wanted to create a log directory and then inside of the log directory i wanted to create big dir directory so i could do make dir with minus p option and then slash temp slash logs slash big dir you see what it will do is it will create log directories and then as well as big dir hit enter okay we got the prompt back meaning it it worked and how do you verify it first make sure you are in the right directory pwd yes i'm in temp and now this directory should have logs directory let's check that by running ls minus l and you see right here yes it has if you do ls minus ltr then it will show all the way at the bottom perfect now inside of this directory we should have a big dir directory so let's check that let's go inside of this directory by doing cd change dir directory space logs all right we got the prompt back meaning it works so let's do pwd to see which directory i am in i am in slash temp slash logs now let's do ls minus l to see what's inside of this directory and we do have a big dir directory inside of this directory. Okay, so right now, every time you create a directory, by default, it gives you these permissions. By the way, permission is another thing that we will talk about later on on this course. So for now, I just wanted to tell you, if you wanted to create a directory with a different permissions, 
you could use minus M options, which is right here with the permission, um, with the right octal level permissions um, that we will cover again later on. And that will create a directory with your desired permissions. All right, that's about it, about creating directories and removing directories. If you want to learn more about Linux, check out my best-selling course on Linux at udemy.com or you could go straight to my website utclsolutions.com and you will find the exact same course there. In this video, we will learn another Linux file management command and that is copy command. In short, CP. The actual command is CP. So, the CP command in Linux is used to copy files and directories. It is one of the most used commands in Linux. So the basic syntax of the CP command is CP space the source, meaning which file or directory you are trying to copy, space the destination, the name of the new copied file or directory, or which directory are you trying to copy the source file to okay so you can copy multiple files and directories at once as well to do that to copy for example files my file one and my file two to the directory my dir you will run the command cp my file one my file two and then the name of the directory you are copying it to. Make sure myder is the directory that exists before you run this command. Otherwise, it will tell you, hey, this myder directory does not exist. Okay, you can also copy directory directories recursively. That is copying all the files and subdirectories in the directory. For example, to copy directory, my dir recursively to the directory new dir you will run the command cp space minus r or hyphen r my dir which is the source directory and you want to copy everything inside of my dir as well that's why we're using recursive to which directory to new dir so if the new dir does not exist, then in this case, it will create a new directory for you and copy everything of my dir to the new dir directory. Okay, that's it. Let's log into our Linux machine and practice the copy command. All right, so I have my Linux machine open right here, Linux VM. Okay, let me move this a little to the side, okay? And let's see which directory am I in. So we will do PWD. Okay, good. I am in my home directory. What's inside of it? Let's do ls minus ltr. There are some directories. There are a couple of files. Perfect. Okay, so I want to copy my file one, my file two, or just copy my file one. So in order to copy my file one, the my file one file has to exist, right? So let's say if you do cp file, sorry, my file one, and you wanted to name the, this copied file as my file two, it will give you an error message saying no such file or directory because the source file does not exist. Okay, so first we'll do is we'll create the file touch my file one okay good let's make sure it is created yes it is now you could copy my file one and name the my file one to my file two of course you cannot do copy my file one and then use the same name my file one again because two same file names or two same files that have a same name cannot exist in the same directory. Okay, so you did copy my file one to my file two, hit enter. Okay, you got your prompt back, no error message. It means it worked perfectly. To verify it, do ls minus ltr or ls minus l, whichever option that you like. And you see at the bottom, now I have my 
second file as well, which is my file two. So now I have two files, my file one and my file two. Perfect. Now let's practice the second command, which is what if um, I wanted to copy both of them, my file one and my file two, to a directory called my dir. So if you do this, you could do copy my file one to my file two. And if you specify the name my dir, then it will give you an error message because my dir does not exist. Let's see, let's run it. See, it says copy the target where you're trying to copy these files is not a directory because it does not exist. So first what we have to do is we have to create the mydir. So in order to create a directory, what is the command you use? M-K-D-I-R, yes, exactly. If you got it right, excellent. All right, make directory. The name of the directory is mydir. Hit enter. Now do ls minus ltr to make sure that directory is created. Yes, you see all the way at the bottom, it created your directory. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so now we will run the command to copy multiple files into an existing directory, and that is copy my file one, my file two, to the directory that we created in the previous step, and hit enter. And if you get the prompt back, no error message, it means it worked perfectly. How do we know it worked perfectly? First, you run ls minus ltr and you see these files my file one exists here my file one exists here because you copied you did not move them so the copy the source will also stay okay now we have to verify if those copy went to another copy to its destination which is my dir for that you have to go into the my dir directory and in order to go into my dir you have to do cd to change directory to my dir beautiful which directory you are in now do pwd it will tell you you are in slash home i have zol my dir okay now if i do ls minus ltr you'll see it has two files my file one and two okay it means it worked perfectly now we could copy the entire my dir to new dir Okay, so for that, I have to come one step out of my dir because I am right now in home, I have Zol and my dir. I wanted to get out of my dir. So for that, you go one step back, cd dot dot, hit enter. Now do pwd to make sure you are in slash home slash I have Zol. Yes, I am. Let's make sure the directory that you're trying to copy recursively exists, which is my dir. Yes, it does. Perfect. Let's run the command cp minus r, which is recursively, and we wanted to copy everything inside of this directory as well as this directory, of course, my dir. And then I wanted to name, the, the copy the directory with, with its contents to a new name, new dir, and hit enter. You got the prompt back, no error message, which means the command ran successfully how do we verify ls minus ltr and now you will see it has two directories my dir which is the old one which you had the files and the new one new dir can we verify if it had the copied content from my dir of course let's do cd new dir and now do ls minus ltr and there you have both of your files that were copied excellent all right, so I'm sure by now you have a good grip on the copy command. Please try to create some files and copy them uh, and move them around from one from one source to another, meaning from one directory to another, copy them around. Please practice because practice makes a man perfect. All right, I'll see you in the next video. If you want to learn more about Linux, check out my best-selling course on Linux at udemy.com or you could go straight to my website utclsolutions.com and you will find the exact same course there. Hey folks, in this video we will learn another Linux file management command and that is remove command and in short or the actual 
name of the command is rm. So the rm command in Linux is used to remove files and directories. It is one of the most powerful commands in Linux, but is also one of the most dangerous commands. So just be careful. The reason I'm saying it's dangerous is because you could accidentally remove some of the configuration file and you're going to have a lot of hard time starting up your system. Okay, so the basic syntax of the RM command is remove the file name or the directory name. Now, to remove a directory, use the minus R option because without my minus R option, it will not remove the directory. This command will remove everything that is inside of that directory and that directory itself. Okay, so for example, to remove the directory miter and all its contents, run the command rm space minus r, which is option r or hyphen r miter. Please note, once a file or directory is removed, it cannot be recovered. Yes, because there is no trash can or recycling bin in Linux on which you accidentally remove a file and you could go back and recover it. Unless you have a file system backup of your system. Um, and usually that happens if the, your system is in the corporate environment. So anyway, my point is please very, very, very careful when you run rm command to delete any file or directory. Here are a few options of rm command. Minus F option, if RM command is used with minus F option, will force the removal operation even if the file or directory does not exist. I'll tell you what, I, what it exactly means. Minus I option, prompt the user before removing a file or directory. Minus R option, recursively remove directories and their contents. Minus V, verbose output, which shows the, the names of the files and directories that are being removed. If you want to remove all files in the current directory, you could simply do rm space asterisk or star and will delete all the files within that directory. If you want to remove all the directories in the current directory, then you will run rm minus d and asterisk. Okay, let's log in and practice rm command. All right, so my Linux machine is right here. It's open. I started up through the virtual box. I powered it on, and it's right here. The terminal is open. If you don't have a terminal open, go ahead and click on terminal, and it will open up your terminal. Once you have the terminal open, make sure you're logged in as yourself. Uh, who am I? And it will tell you I have Zol. This is a command to know who you logged in as. The reason I'm asking you to check who you logged in as because we are going to run rm command and you don't want to log in as root and remove uh, certain files or directories that are very critical to the system okay so once you verify you logged in as yourself then uh, check which directory you are in so you do pwd and you'll see you are in slash home slash ifsol okay very good what's inside of this directory you could do always ls minus l ltr or whatever the command or options that you choose to okay so we verified everything we needed to before we run any of our linux file uh, management command okay so we're doing rm so let's run rm to delete a file first so we have a file for example my file one and i wanted to delete it simply rm file one hit enter it says Cannot remove file one, no such file or directory. Hmm, you know why? Because there is no file that with that name. So the name that I'm trying to remove is my file one. Okay, very good. So we did a trial and error thing. That's good. My file one. Okay, so when when I get my prompt back without any error message, it mean it got rid of my file one. See right here. You see my file one when I ran the command ls minus l. Now, if I run ls minus l again, you're not going to see that file any longer. Let's do ls minus l. 
So you see it's gone. My file one is gone. Beautiful. Okay, now let's talk about deleting a directory. So if I wanted to, for example, delete a directory uh, new dir, this is a new dir directory, and you can see it has D in front of it, which means it's a directory. If I use a rm command or new dir without minus r option, it will give me an error message. It will say cannot remove. It's a directory. That's why I mentioned that you have to use minus r. So rm command would know that you're trying to delete a directory. Okay, hit enter. Now you got your prompt back without any error message. And what does it mean? That means that your command worked. Okay, so when we did ls minus l previously, we did notice that we have new dir directory. Now let's do ls minus l again. And you'll see new dir is no longer there. It's gone. Okay, perfect. So that's how you remove a directory. And as I said, once a file is deleted, you cannot recover it. So it's gone, meaning it's actually gone for good. All right. Then let's move on to minus F, F option. So I could move this here a little so we could view the options. Okay, and move my uh, terminal to the right. Okay, so we could see the option as we go through it. Okay, so minus F option meaning force the removal operation even if the file directly does not exist. Okay, meaning if I do RM, let's say file one, two, three. And you notice in my home directory, there is no such file, file one, two, three. So when I try to remove it, it will tell me, can I remove because there's no such file or directory, dude, right? <laughs> okay, so it's smart enough, it is telling me. But if you don't want it to view this message and you just want it to remove it regardless whether it exists or not, you don't care, then you use rm minus f option file one two three and hit enter and you see it worked it the file didn't exist but it still worked the reason we use minus f option now you're probably thinking then why do you use it if the file doesn't exist it's because many times we run um rm command within a script so when you're running a rm command in a script the script will complain, hey, this file does not exist, but you don't really care. You just want it to delete whether it exists or not. Then you will specify minus F option. Okay, next one is minus I prompt the user before removing a file or directory. Okay, so if I wanted to delete my file two, which is right here in my home directory, I want it to prompt me a warning or something. Hey, you're trying to delete my file one. So I'll do R minus I my file two and hit enter and it will say remove regular empty file. Well, empty is because there is no content inside C zero. And that's when you say yes, it will delete it, which is with Y or no, that it won't delete it. So if you say no, it won't delete it. And you will see if you do LS minus L, you'll still see my file one is there. Now, if you're thinking why we would, we would use it and you already have an answer, then you are one step ahead. So basically minus I is used because if you accidentally remove or trying to remove a file and then you will rem realize, oh my God, I removed a file which I should not have, but it's too late by then. So it's always good that you use with minus option, I option. So the operating system will tell you, hey, you're trying to remove this file. Are you sure about it? So it's just like a, a check before you delete it. Okay, that's why we use minus I. Okay, then comes minus R. Recursively remove directories and their contents. So if you wanted to delete everything inside of a directory, then you could use rm minus r for example my dir so we could do rm minus r my dir then it will delete everything inside of this directory so let's go <clears throat> it will delete not only this directory but everything inside of this directory too so right now 
I don't want to delete, but I'm just showing you because I wanted to try another command before I delete it. Okay, next one is a verbose output, which shows the name of the files and directory that are being removed. Okay, so if I am going to remove, let me make a copy of my dir and with minus r option and let's create recreate my new dir it's there yes okay now let's remove with minus v new dir and hit enter oh it says it's a directory so we have to use minus r with the v okay all right so it removed my file one it removed my file two and then it removed new directory see how dash verbos is actually showing you what it exactly removed okay now let me recreate that directory first of all let's verify it's gone it's gone so let me recreate copy minus r my dir new dir it is created yes it is created now if you want to remove everything inside of new dir so let's go to new dir first and let's see what's inside okay now you want to delete everything inside instead of deleting one by one you could do rm minus oh sorry rm space asterisk hit enter and everything inside where i am it's gone well, how can you verify ls minus l see nothing in there total zero excellent similarly to remove all directories in a current directory you will do rm minus d and asterisk if there was a directory inside of new dir all right that's about our rm command remove command again as i said please be very careful when you're using rm command and of course try to create new directories of files inside of your home directory and practice remove command if you want to learn more about linux check out my best-selling course on linux at udemy.com or you could go straight to my website, utclsolutions.com, and you will find the exact same course there. Hey folks, in this video, we will learn another Linux file management command, and that is move command. The move command, which is in short MV, an actual name of the command in Linux is used to move files and directories to a different location. The basic syntax of the MV command is move MV, the source, meaning which file you're trying to move, followed by the destination. Where are you moving it to? You can move multiple files and directories as well. For example, to move the files data1 and data2 to the directory sysdata you will run the command move data1 data2 to the directory sysdata make sure the sysdata directory exists in order to move these files over to it okay you can also use the move command to rename files and directories yes the move command serves two purposes one it moves the file or directory from one location to another location and the second purpose is it renames a file or a directory as well so just remember that so to rename a file let's say data1 to raw1 you could run the command mv or move data1 to the new name raw1 yep all right, let's look at some of the options that are available under the command move. First one is minus F, which force the move operation even if the destination file or directory already exists. And that is pretty much just like the RM command and has a minus F option, which forces the operation of the remove regardless it exists or not. Then there is minus I option, prompt the user before overriding an existing file or directory. Then the U move only files or directories that are newer than the corresponding files or directories in the destination directory. 
Yep. So if you whatever file or directory that you're moving to whichever location, if it already has a file existed with the same name, and if you don't want to override it, then you could use minus a U option, and that will only move files that are newer than the corresponding files. Okay, then there is a V, of course, verbos, which shows the names of the file and directory that you are moving or are being moved. All right, so let's log in and practice the move command. Okay, I started up my Oracle VirtualBox already, and I powered off my Linux machine already. So let's bring my Linux machine, and right here, I'm logged in as who am I, which will tell me who am I logged in as. I'm logged in as I have Sol, that is good. Which directory am I in? You can run the command pwd print working directory and it will tell you you are in slash home slash i have all right what's inside of my home directory you could check that by running ls minus l command with lt option lr ltr option or whatever option you like so if you just run it by ls minus l option you will see all the files and directories in alphabetical order okay here you have the first two are the files and the remaining ones are the directories and as mentioned previously anything that does not start with a d are the files any any of the first columns bit that starts with d is a directory okay so we verified that we have directory and files excellent now let's practice move command so let's say i wanted to move data one to data two so first let's create a file data one in order to create a file data one you can run the command touch data one let's verify it okay so the data one exists beautiful now if i wanted to move the data file in a directory called let's say sysdata right this is the directory that we talked about yes sysdata so first we need to create that directory so make dir sysdata verify it is there yes all the way at the bottom see sysdata is the directory that is created so if i wanted to move a data one to sysdata all i have to do mv data one that's a file that you're trying to move. And where are you moving it to? I'm moving it to sysdata. Hit enter. When you get the prompt back, meaning the command was successful. Now, first verify if that data file is gone from this current directory, which is slash home slash I have solved. Because when we run, when we ran as ls minus ltr previously, it, it did have the data one so now let's run it again and we wanted to make sure the data one file is no longer in that directory which is not excellent so now let's go to cd sysdata which is the directory in which we moved that data one file to so let's go in there by changing the directory cd sysdata then let's make sure you are in the right directory pwd slash home i have sol sys data yes now let's do ls minus l to check if that data one file exists it does excellent all right so our move command worked it moved from my slash home slash i have sol to slash home slash i have sol slash sys data beautiful okay so let me move this file back to slash home slash i have all so mv data one and move to home i have all so you could specify the entire path as well because you are not in slash home slash i have all so hit enter okay let's check if the file already moved or still here yes it's not here okay in which directory i'm in I'm in slash home slash I have all says data. I moved that file from this to where to slash home slash I have all right. 
Okay, so let's move one step back. CD dot dot. Which directory am I in? I'm in slash home slash IFZOL. Perfect. Now let's check if the file was moved. Yes, you see, data one file is moved. Beautiful. Now let's create another file. Touch data two. Now I have two files with the name data one and data two. Now I could move multiple files, data one, data two, at the same time with one command to a directory. And that would be simply move data one, data two. Where do you want it to move it to? Sys data. We got the prompt back without any error message, which means yes, the command was successful. Let's verify in this directory which I'm in if the data one and data two file already exist or not. LS minus L and it does not exist. Sorry, they do not exist because they're multiple files, yes. Now let's go to the directory that I moved them into and that is right here, sysdata. I am in slash home, I have Zol, I'm gonna CD into sysdata and do ls minus ltr and you'll see data one, data two files are there. Excellent, okay. Now, what if I wanted to rename a data one to raw one? Then you use the same command move. Okay, so I wanted to use mv data one. Now, if you don't specify the directory where you wanted to move it to, then it will think that you are trying to rename it. Okay, so I'm not specifying any directory. I am specifying a new name, and that is raw one. Hit enter, give me a prompt back, which means the command was successful. Okay, how do we verify? LS minus L, and you'll see data one is now raw one. Nice. See, that's how the second purpose of the move command comes into action when you actually change the name. Okay, let's moving on to the options. Let me move this here. The first one is force move operation even if the destination file or directory already exist. Okay, so if I am in slash home slash I have all slash sysdata and I know I have uh, two files in there, raw one, raw and data two. Now if I go one step back, dot dot in my home IFZOL directory and I create a file called data2. Now I'm in a different directory that's why it's going to allow me to create that as well. Okay it is created. Let's check if it's created. Yes data2 is created. Now if I try to move this now data2 in sysdata see it actually overwrite that the the one that it already had so if you go to sysdata you see it has a newer timestamp now before the timestamp were 1153 and now the newer timestamp is 1156 because it override now this one saying force the move operation even if the destination file or directory already exists. Sometimes the reason you have minus F is sometimes the permission of a file won't allow you to override. So if you use minus F option, then it will override regardless what permissions there are on. That's what it, the F option is. Then minus I move before you or a prompt before you move. So let's say, I am in slash home, I have Zol, move one step back, cd dot dot, that is my LTR. I create a new file, data three, touch data three. Now I wanted to move this to sysdata, so move minus I, data three to sysdata. Data three to sysdata, okay, it didn't move, it didn't prompt me for, um, is the option says again prompt the user before overriding an existing oh to override okay so if data 3 already existed in sysdata then it would have um, prompted me so let's do that again touch 
data3. Now I'm going to create another file with the same name data3. Now I'm going to move minus i with data3 to sysdata. Now keep in mind sysdata already exists in sysdata. So now I'm going to move another data3 to sysdata. Now let's see what it's going to say. Ah, see? Now it's asking, do you want to override data3 file that already exists in sysdata? Now you could say yes or no. So anyway, let's say no. That's fine. It's not going to override. Then you have you move only files or directory that are newer than corresponding one. Verbos output shows the names of the files and directory that are being moved. Simple as that. And I'm sure you know that practice, practice, practice. Um, move command is very important when it comes to moving from one file to another, sorry, from one directory to another and renaming it. Awesome. I will see you in the next video where we'll learn another new Linux file management command. If you want to learn more about Linux, check out my best-selling course on Linux at udemy.com or you could go straight to my website utclsolutions.com and you will find the exact same course there. In this video, we are going to cover displaying a Linux file contents and the command, the very first command that is used to view or display a file content is cat command. The cat command in Linux is a standard utility used to concatenate and display the contents of a file. The name cat is derived from its capability to concatenate, which is to join together multiple files. But it's most frequently used to quickly display the content of a file or file. So you just have to remember that we are, if you want to view the contents of a file, you use the cat command. The basic syntax of the cat command is cat followed by the file name, the file that you want to view its content. To display a file content, for example, for Etsy password, and by the way, the password file is the file that has the account information of every user that is created in Linux. So I'm just using it as an example. So if you want to display the contents of the file, which is located in Etsy directory, then you could specify cat followed by the full path of that file, cat slash etsy slash password. If you don't want to specify the full path, then you could cd into slash etsy directory and then simply do cat password. The cat command can be used to view multiple files at the same times as well. Yes, so you could do cat space the password, which is one file, and then uh, space the second file, so it will show or it will display the contents of the first file first and then it will display the content of the second file. Now let's look at the option that are available under cat. The first one is minus n. It will show the number of all output lines starting from one. So if you have 10 lines, it will start and it will actually label each line starting with one all the way to 10. Uh, for example, cat minus n and slash etsy slash password. Then the second option is minus b. Display the content of a file with numbered lines, excluding blank lines. So if there are blank lines inside of a file, then it will exclude it and then it will display the, the actual content number lines. And then um, the last one, of course, not the least, there are many other options as well. Cat minus b file oh sorry uh, actually cat minus b is the actual option that is displayed to exclude blank clients so the next one is what i wanted to show the next option is uh, show dollar sign at the end of each line so you could run simply cat minus e and file one and it will show dollar sign at the end all right so let's log in and practice the cat command in our linux system i already have my virtual box up and i started powered up my linux virtual machine Okay, so right here is my Linux machine. Let me log in. Okay, wrong password. Sorry about that. Okay, I'm logged in. Who am I? As I'm logged in, I'm logged in as myself. Where am I? I'm in my slash home directory. Okay, what's inside my directory? Let's check these other files and directories in my side, inside of my home directory. Simple practice, please make sure you practice that every time you log in just to make sure you're in the right location. 
Okay, so if you want to view the content of a file, so let's say I wanted to view the content of Etsy password, I could simply do cat slash Etsy slash password, and it will show me what's inside of this file. Now, if I wanted to go inside of the Etsy directory first and then cat it, I could do that as well. So CD slash Etsy. Now I could do cat password. And by the way, you wanted to see what's inside of this directory. There's a, a lot of directories and files. It's just gonna go through the screen really fast. See, you could actually scroll up from your scroll bar right here and view the list of all the files and directories and so on inside of Etsy. Anyway, let's uh, clear the screen so we don't have to see all those files and directories. Now, which directory are we in? We are in Etsy directory. We know there's a file inside of it. It's called password file. Make sure it's not the whole word password. It's P-A-S-S-W-D. Okay, so let's do cat P-A-S-S-W-D. By the way, if you type wrong, let's say O-R-D, it will tell you no such file or directory. It's just that simple. So we know the right one is P-A-S-S-D, P-A-S-S-W-D, sorry. Hit enter and you have a list of all the entries of every user that is created in the Linux uh, file uh, in the Linux system. So there's a whole list, how they are set up, uh, what each entry means. You don't have to worry about it. Just focus on viewing the content so we could see the content. So when you are in Windows, right, how do you view a content of a file? Basically, you double click, the file opens up depending on if it's a, a Word file, if it's an Excel file, or wherever you have written your content, it will open up in that, in that particular application and it will show you the content. In Linux, we don't really have these different applications. Everything is just simple flat text files. So you could use cat command to view the content of every flat text file in Linux, which we just did. Okay, perfect. Now, the next one I said, if you want to view the content of the two files, like password and group, you could run cat and follow by both commands. But first, let me do cat on group just to see what's inside. And you'll see right here, it has a list of all the groups that are created inside of Linux operating system. Where you got? Okay, now if you wanted to view both of them, you could do simply cat password group. And right here, it's going to show it on the screen so fast that you would think that if nothing happened, but actually it happened. So I'll show you if you scroll up. See right here is the command that we ran, right? Cat, password, and group. And right here, it gave me the output of the password file. Then it gave me the output of group file. You see, you could actually view the contents of multiple files at once. All right, excellent. Moving on, minus N option, okay. So if you wanted to view the list of all contents in the numbered line, then you could use cat minus N password. And you'll see on the first column, it tell you the numbers and it tell you each entry, it has a number in front of it. So I could tell there are 37 entries in password file. That's what the main purpose of minus N. Minus B is display the content of a file with number lines excluding blank. So I could show you with an example. Let me go to my home directory by hitting CD. Hit enter and it will take you to your home directory to PWD. I'm in home, I have ZOL. I'm gonna create a file, touch file one. The file is created, let's verify it. Yes, it's there. Now I'm gonna add some content into the file using Vim editor. By the way, don't focus on Vim editor right now. I will cover Vim editor later on in this course. So Vim is the actual file editor that allows you to add content inside of the file. So I'm just adding it just to show you the, the actual um, cat command. So let's say this is file one content and I'm putting it a space here. Um, there, for example, there, okay, now we are learning Linux in this course. Perfect. Okay, I have created it. Now, in order to view that file content, I could do cat file one, and you'll see it has these three lines. One is the line that 
this file one is file one content then empty line and then the third line is we are learning Linux in this course now if you use minus n option cat minus n file one you'll see it tells you one two three lines right because it is counting the second empty line as well now if you want to exclude that that's when you come the B option cat minus B file one and this one is only going to show you the actual content and the number with that content. Beautiful. And the last one is really quickly about minus E show dollar sign at the end of each line. You could do that by doing cat minus E file one and it will show you dollar sign at the end of each line. Simple as that. There's a purpose behind it, but don't worry about it. Just keep that in mind. All right, so this is uh, what we learned in uh, this video is about how you could view the content of a file. Unlike in Windows where you just simply double click, here you have to run the command cat. I'll see you in the next video. If you want to learn more about Linux, check out my best-selling course on Linux at udemy.com or you could go straight to my website utclsolutions.com and you will find the exact same course there. Hey folks, in this video, we will learn another file display command. So in order to view the content of a file, you could use cat command or you could use more command. Now, what's the difference? The more command in Linux is used to view the contents of files in a page by page fashion, which can be particularly useful for reading longer files. Unlike cat command, which displays the entire content of a file at once, more lets you scroll through the file. The navigation control, meaning once you run the command more space the file name, you could do certain navigation controls. And that is when you're using more, the following keyboard controls can be utilized. And that is space to display the next page, meaning when you do more, followed by the name of the file, it will show you one page. If you want to go to the next page, then you hit the space bar. If you want to go to the next line, you hit enter. And if you want to go back one page, you do B. And if you want to quit, you just simply do Q and it will quit out of the more command mode. The basic syntax of the more command is more, of course, space followed by the file name, just like cat followed by the file name. Then to display a file content of Etsy password, for example, we could use the same thing, more slash Etsy slash password. Now, of course, the password file is located inside of the directory Etsy. That's why we are specifying the full path of the, the location Etsy password. Or you could go inside of the Etsy directory and simply do more password. The options that are available with more is minus F counts the logical lines rather than screen lines. P clears the screen before displaying each page. S squeezes a lo multiple lines into a single blank line and plus start at a specific line. For example, more plus 10 File.txt will start viewing file.txt at the 11th line. Okay, let's log in and practice more command. All right, I already have a Oracle virtual box up. I powered up my virtual machine, Linux virtual machine. Let me go in and I have a terminal right here. Perfect. Okay, so if I wanted to view a content of a file using more command, I could use more slash Etsy slash password and you see right here it is telling me this is one page starting for the first line up to here this is one page of that file and it's telling me more is that it is showing 97 percent of the file content if i wanted to go to the next page i would hit spacebar and it gives me the remaining content of that file. I could make this window terminal a little smaller. You'll see, and then the more command will work 
based on the size of the window. Yep, let's clear the screen and now do again more Etsy password and hit enter. You see now it is showing us what is available space on this terminal. And based on the available space and what is outputting on the screen, it's showing that it is outputting 64% of the content of the file. If I wanted to view more content, I would hit space bar and it will take me to the next page. If I wanted to view one line at a time, I could hit enter. See, one line at a time, one line at a time, one line at a time. If I wanted to do page by page, again, hit spacebar and it will show me that rest. This tool is really, really useful because a lot of times in corporate environment, you do have huge, large files with thousands and thousands of pages. And if you use cat command, everything is going to show on the screen really fast. It's going to go through your eyes that you, want it, you wouldn't be able to read it. That's when the more command comes to your rescue. Okay, let's see what other options are. F count logical lines rather than the screen lines. It's just that simple. Clears the screen before displaying each page. Okay, let's try that one. Again, clear the screen first for me to clear the screen. Now let's try more minus P option. This is P option, right? Just making sure P, yes. Space at C password. Hit enter. It is showing me all of the content of Etsy password up to 64%. Now, if I hit spacebar, you see it cleared the previous content that was showing on the screen and it showed me what is left over of the page. Very nice. Works beautifully. Squeeze multiple blank lines into a single blank line. It's just straightforward. I don't have to go and explain that to you. Start at a specific line, for example, more 10 file, then you could use this minus, oh, sorry, plus option, plus and the number that you wanted to see. Okay, very good. So if you wanted to do, let's say, you remember the cat command and you would do minus N at C password, right? And it will tell you, let me make this bigger again. Okay, and clear the screen. Let me run the command again cat minus n at c password and now it's telling me all these lines with the numbers on it now i wanted to view using more command starting with for example number line sorry number 10 i'll do more plus 10 and the file name at c password and it starts you see it starts right here from the operator okay see that's what you use the plus sign followed by the number of the line. All right, it's just that simple. The more command simply, uh, pretty much just like cat command, the difference is more, you could view the pages one at a time. All right, awesome, I'll see you in the next video. If you want to learn more about Linux, check out my best-selling course on Linux at udemy.com or you could go straight to my website, utclsolutions.com and you will find the exact same course there. Hey folks, in this video, we are going to learn two additional commands that we use to display Linux file contents, and that are head and tail. In Linux, the head and tail commands are utilities that display the beginning and the end of files, respectively. They can be especially useful when dealing with large files where you can only want to see a subset of content. So the basic syntax of the head and tail commands is head followed by the file name, tail followed by the file name. So same way when we learn cat, you specify the, the command followed by the file name and more followed by the file name. Okay, options for the head command is one of the option is minus N. Of course, I'm picking up only the most used prominent ones. There are many of them. Um, you could the first one is minus n which will display the first number of lines of a file so if you want to display let's say the first five lines of a file you could use head minus n the five and the name of the file 
You could use Etsy password, file one, or whatever the file that you want to view. Uh, if you want to display 100 bytes of a file, you use minus C option, like head minus C, 100, and the name of the file. Then let's go to the option of tail command. And tail command also have the same way, minus N, and it displays the last number of lines of the, of the file. Now, you, as you notice by now, head, the reason it, that it is named head, because it always starts from the beginning. And you want to view the beginning of certain lines, then you use head. And the reason that the command tail is named tail, because it always starts at the bottom, if you want to view the bottom, bottom number of lines. Then, okay, so again, a tail minus N, if you want to view the last five lines of a file, file one or at C password or whichever file. Then same way, you could use the minus C option as well for bytes size, uh, tail minus C 100 file one. Another cool feature or cool option, I would say, in uh, tail command that is not available in head, and that is minus F option. This app option is used to display a log file in real time. For example, if you have a log file in var log and file name is messages, and you run tail minus F on that file, then it will stay in that mode while the messages are keep on logging into that file. If you have a file as syslog or whatever the file you have, you could use tail minus F and it will remain there and show you all the messages as they come through. Isn't that cool? Yep, it is. All right, let's log in and practice these commands. Okay, I have already opened my virtual box and I powered up my virtual machine that runs Linux. Let me go to my Linux machine. Let me log in. Okay, excellent. Let me move the window a little to the right. Always as I do, and I ask you to practice, see who you logged in as, who am I? You are logged in as yourself, which directory you are in, you are in your home directory, what's inside, ls minus l, or whatever the option. Okay, beautiful. You confirmed everything, run clear command to clear the screen. Okay, now if you wanted to view the first five lines of Etsy password file, you could do head minus n, five at C password. You only get the first five lines, right? Beautiful. By the way, I have specified the entire path of the at C password. If you CD into CD at C, then you don't have to specify the entire path. Then all you have to do is head minus N five and then just the file name and it'll give you the first five lines. Now, how do you confirm it is giving me the first file line? Well, you could run the cat command with minus N option on password to make sure it is giving the first file line. So just remember, it starts with root and the fifth line is LP. Okay, let's see if these are. this is true. First line is root and the fifth line is LP. Yep, beautiful. You see? If you don't want it to view any of the contents of a file, you only care about the first five lines or 10 lines or whatever the number of lines that you are interested or that you desire in, you use the head command. That's the beauty of these tools. Okay, if you wanted to view the, uh, the file with bytes, you could do head minus C, 100, and password file, and it will give you only the number of content or lines that has 100 bytes. Okay, moving on to tail. Tail, same way, both commands the same. Now, what if you wanted to view the last four lines of Etsy password, which is 34, 35, 36, 37? Same way you do tail minus N, give me the last four of Etsy password, and you get the last four starting with right here just make sure you are on the right page right here starts one two three four now if you confuse all the time okay where is the output where is it not showing it's always good to hit enter a few times so it will go up and you will see a quite a few break and then you can run the command again tail minus n four 
password and you will see your output separated from the previous command output so it will be a lot easier to read okay anyway last four lines start with crony dns tcp and my ifsol let's see if this is the right one one two three four perfect beautiful yes that's why we wanted to use head and tail commands okay tail minus c same way will work the same way as head then tail minus f let's cover this last option now there is a log file in linux system i'm going to go to the log file cd etc sorry and it is in var log and there is a file in it called messages so if you do tail minus f on it Okay, first of all, it's telling you you cannot read that file because uh, you are not root user. See, permission denied. So in order to show you this option, I have to log in as root. And in order to become root, I have to run the command su switch user space dash or hyphen and hit enter. Now here it's asking you to provide the root password. And this is the password that you actually created when you go when you went through the linux installation so please make sure you're providing the right password i have provided the right password and it took it and right away it gave me root and this is the root prompt which is hashtag not the pound dollar which is regular user i could also check by typing who am i and it's telling you you are logged in as root excellent so we confirm we logged in as root now let's go to cd slash var slash log and now run the command tail minus f messages and here you will see it is see it's blinking right at the bottom see it is basically staying here it will stuck here and it will output or show you on the screen for whatever the new messages that actually comes in this linux system right now i'm not doing anything but let's say if i wanted to do um something let's say i open up a new terminal new window see as soon as i open up a new terminal or new window the linux operating system realized that something is going on or there's activity and it actually logged the activity and it says right here see started application launch genome shell started this and that and see how it is showing you as whatever that activity being done on the system in real time wow isn't that cool so that's the whole purpose of showing you the minus f option now if you wanted to get out of this blinking and want to get your prompt back you could do control and c on your keyboard and it'll get you your prompt back if you wanted to get out of a root and wanted to become your own user simply type exit and you are back how do you know you are back who am i you are i have solved excellent all right the main purpose of this lesson is to teach you how to use head and tail command and i'm sure you understand by now please practice and i'll see you in the next video if you want to learn more about Linux, check out my best-selling course on Linux at udemy.com or you could go straight to my website utclsolutions.com and you will find the exact same course there. Hey boys and girls and welcome to Linux Advanced Administration which is the section 4 of this course. In this section, we are going to learn some of the advanced commands that are used in Linux. And the first one we will learn is how you could change a password in Linux. So when it comes to changing the password, you could change the password as your own user account, or you could change the password of other users by becoming root user, which is the most powerful user in Linux. Then we will learn file content manipulation commands, commands such as echo, cut, awk, grep, sort, unique, word count, and so on. Then we will learn the file permissions, how the permissions are assigned to file or a directory like read, write, and executable. 
Then we will learn file system security management commands, how you could assign those permissions using command like change mod, change owner, or change group. Then on the fifth one, we will learn user account management in which we will cover each of these command one by one in detail as to how you could add a user, delete a user, how you could add a group, delete a group, and then modify existing user with user mod command. And then the last part of this section, entire section is the Linux file editor, which is one of the most important piece where you need to learn how to edit a file using an editor. And we will pick a Vim editor, which is an advanced level editor. And we will learn how you can modify or edit an existing file or create a new file. All right, that's about in section four. Let's go and get started right away. If you want to learn more about Linux, check out my best-selling course on Linux at udemy.com or you could go straight to my website utclsolutions.com and you will find the exact same course there. Hey folks, in this video we are going to learn how you could change password of a user or a root account in Linux operating system. The password command in Linux is used to change or update a user's password. Please note it is a P-A-S-S-W-D command and not the entire word password with O-R in it command. Okay, the basic syntax of the password command is password and this command will change the password of the logged in user. So if you just run the command P-A-S-S-W-D without any option or any arguments, then it will going to change the user of what you logged in as. So to change the password of other users, you will have to be the root user, which is the most powerful user in Linux. So in order to become root user, you have to run the command SU, which is switch user space hyphen. And then it will ask you for the password for the root account. And then once you logged in as root account, then you could run the command password space the username of the user account you wanted to change the password off. Okay, what are the options that can be used with the password command? You could use password minus L to lock a user account. For example, password space minus L followed by the name or the username of an account. You to, in order to unlock that same user account, you could use minus U option and another one is minus E option, which will force password expiration. So if you run password space minus E space minus IFSL, this will force that user to change the password when the next time that user logs in. Okay, let's log into our Linux system, uh, which I have a virtual machine on Oracle VirtualBox. And let's, let me bring that up. Okay, so, oops. All right, so right here is my Linux machine and I'm using CentOS Linux operating system. So first thing is um, who am I logged in as? So do who am I? I'm logged in as I of Sol, okay. Which directory I am in? So who, PWD print working directory, I'm in my home directory, perfect. Uh, to confirm what's inside of my directory, you could do ls command and it will list all the files and directories. Now, when, it's, when it comes to changing the password, please also run one more command to make sure that you're changing the password on the right system. So you could run the command host name and it will give you the name of your operating system, Linux operating system, for me, it has Linux CentOS, the host name. So if you are in a corporate environment and you are managing hundreds of thousands of Linux servers, then in order to change on one server, please make sure you run the host name command to make sure you're logged in in the right machine. Okay, now 
I'm logged in as I have Zal. Now, if I wanted to change the password of myself, then I will run, simply run the command P-A-S-S-W-D, hit enter, and it's going to ask you changing password for user I have Zal. So what is the existing password? Please provide the existing password. Okay, now it's going to ask you what is the new password that you wanted to change it to. So let me give a new password. Okay, again, retype your new password. Make sure it matches with the one that you typed earlier. Okay, password all authentication tokens updated successfully. Excellent. So that's how you change a password of the user that you logged in. Now, what if you wanted to change a password of another user? So you have to log in as root. So in order to log in as root, you type su space hyphen and hit enter. Now this is going to change your account from Ivesal to root. And it's asking you to put in the password for root. Make sure you know and you remember the password. If you don't remember, it's not going to let you log in as root. Now, how do I know I'm logged in as root? Well, two ways. One is my prompt right here is changed to root. And instead of um, right here, you see instead of I have Zol, now the prompt, the entire prompt has this root. Also, the last thing in the prompt is as a regular user, I had dollar sign. And as root, I have, have pound or hashtag sign. Also, you could run who am I, which will tell you you're logged in as root. Excellent. Now, let's move this to the right and let's check the other, other options, okay? See, the other options is if I wanted to change the password of other user, then I could do password minus L to specify, sorry, not this is to lock the account, password space, the username. Simply password for I have Zol, okay? And it's gonna ask him changing password for user I have Zol. Now being a root user, you see you changing a password of another user. Now it's not gonna ask you what is the current or existing user password. It's just prompting you for new password. That's why you, root user is very powerful. Let's specify or put your new password. The password fails the dictionary check, that's fine. You are root, you could do whatever you want. Okay, all token authentications have been updated. See, now we have changed the password for I have Zol. Same way we could change any user account password being a root. Now, if I wanted to lock a user account I have Zol, I could do password minus L and the name of the username and it will tell you locking password for user I have Zol. Okay, now when I try to log in next time as I have Zol, it will not let me log in to Linux machine. To unlock, I could do password minus U, I have Zol, and it will unlock my account. Okay, unlocking password for user I have Zol, success. Beautiful. Now, if I wanted to force I have Zol to change the password upon the next login, then I could use minus E option. Anyway, that's just for you to try out. So this is how we learned how you could change a user account password or become a root and change other user accounts password. If you want to learn more about Linux, check out my best selling course on Linux at udemy.com or you could go straight to my website utclsolutions.com and you will find the exact same course there. Hello, in this video we are going to learn a new command echo that allows you to manipulate a Linux file contents. Okay, the echo command in Linux is used to display a line of text or string to a standard output, which is typically the terminal or console. So you could run the command echo and whatever that you want to display on the screen, it will simply output on the screen. That's what it means to standard output. The echo command again is also used to add contents to a file by redirecting that same output that you are having output on the screen to a file. Okay, so the basic syntax of the echo command is echo space any text that you want to echo on the terminal. All right, for example, Echo space, 
hello world and you hit enter, then it will show a hello world on your terminal or on the screen. To add or output content to a file, use redirect sign, which is on your keyboard. So if you wanted to output echo hello world to a file, you could do echo hello world and redirect it to a file name, the name of the file that you wanted to redirect it to. So in our case, it's first file. If you do not have a first file already created, it will create that file for you. Now, instead of displaying that echo, sorry, displaying that hello world string on the screen, it will output that string into the file, which is called first file. Okay, to append it to an existing file, use double redirection. So it will be echo. The world is a beautiful place, for example, which already has echo world line written into it, then you could do double arrow codes, arrow, um, arrows to the file first file. Okay, let me log into my Linux machine and we'll run these commands really quickly. All right, I have my Linux virtual machine open. Okay, let me open that up. Okay, I'm going to first check who am I logged in as. Who am I? I'm logged in as IFSOL. Which directory am I in? I'm in home IFSOL directory. Perfect. Now, inside of this home directory, I wanted to create a file. No, before I create a file, I wanted to run the command echo space hello world. Now, when I hit enter, you're going to notice it basically echo out to the terminal. So now you probably notice, hey, echo, isn't that that same echo when you are, for example, in a hall, a big area or in mountains where you say something and it echo back? Yes, exactly. That's how they got this command name as well. So it echoes whatever you, you type it in. So you do echo, hello world, or echo, for example, one, two, three, it will output one, two, three. So whatever you type after echo, it will echo out on the terminal. Okay, now the next thing is, what if you wanted to echo that output instead of from the screen, echo it toward a file? Okay, let's do that, echo, hello world. And I wanted to output that to my first file. So the name of my file is, First file, it's just the name that I'm picking. You could pick any name. Hit enter. You got your prompt back without any error, which means that command worked. Do ls command to see if it created the file. Yes, it did. You see right here, first file. You could do also ls minus l option to view the listing of the file in, in its alphabetical order. So right here is the first file that you just created. Now, how do I know what's inside of the file or did echo command work? You could do cat command on your file that you created and you are gonna notice that it has the content inside that we just output into and that is echo, that is hello world. Beautiful. Now, what if you want to add more content to the file? You can by typing in, for example, echo the world is a beautiful place, which is, it is indeed. And if you just run with the one redirection and type it in the file name of the file that we already have, which is first file, then it will overwrite that file contents. If you want that to be as a second line in that file, then go back and do two redirects and hit enter. Now you could verify by doing cat first file and you're gonna notice it has two lines now. Hello world and the world is a beautiful place. Okay, so now you learned something. In order to add something to a file, you could use echo command with redirection symbols to add content to an empty file or to a new file or to an existing file. If you want to learn more about Linux, check out my best-selling course on Linux at udemy.com 
or you could go straight to my website, utclsolutions.com, and you will find the exact same course there. Hey folks, in this video, we are going to learn Linux content management command, and that is cut. The cut command in Linux is used to remove or cut out certain sections of a line from a file or from a standard input. It's particularly useful for extracting specific fields from text files, especially files that are delimited by a particular character. When I say character, meaning if a field um, or a certain number of fields are separated by commas, uh, by period, by a space, by a dollar sign, so you could cut it out based on those special character. All right. In order to explain to you how cut command works, I'm going to create a new file called student.txt. And once that file is created, we will add some content inside of that file. So I want you to right now pause this video right now and run this command. I mean, there are five commands, as you could see. Run the first command, echo 101, comma, John, comma, Doe, comma, A, space, greater sign or redirect sign, space, students, dot text. So when you're going to run the first command, it is going to create the file student dot text and add that first line starting with 101. Now with the second line, it will append that content into that file. Third line, fourth line, fifth line, it will do it for you. I have already created this file with all the contents inside of that file. So we could practice and learn our cut command. All right, I'll show you in a second when I log into the, my Linux machine. Now let's look at the um, what's the syntax when you run the cut command. So the basic syntax is cut with any option, then the file name. All right, when we come to the examples, we have example with some options like extract the first name or names of all students. So if we have our students.txt file and we want to extract only the first name from that file, we could run the command cut with minus D, as I said, delimited. And then what character you're specifying, you're specifying, as you can see from the file, it has comma delimited that separates the first field to the second field. So we are saying that look at those comma delimited and minus F, and then you will see with the field, I want the second field and from student.txt file. Same thing, extract the last name and grades of all. You could specify the same command with field number three and four, extract the student ID, which is we know field one, and extract the first three characters from each line. So that is, of course, the first three characters are the ID. We could do cut with minus C because C is for character. And then you specify one, two, three because you want all three first characters. If you just specify three, then it will only take out the third digit from those three characters. Okay, so that's pretty much it all about theory. Let's go log into a Linux machine and let's try to run these commands. Okay, let me go to my Linux machine right here. Let me log in. Wrong password. Okay, I'm logged in. Let me clear my screen terminal. The terminal is open. If you don't have a terminal open, off your Linux machine, you could go to click on terminal right here and it will open it up. Um, I have my Linux machine running under Oracle Virtual Box as a virtual machine. Okay, as I said, I have already created a file student.txt. So I'm logged in as ifsol and I am in my home directory. And when I do ls minus l or ltr, de depending on the options you pick, you're going to notice the student.txt file is already created for me. Now, what's inside of that file? If I do cat and student.txt, you're going to notice that I have all those, all that content that I wanted to be added. 
if you notice from the my slide all that five commands that I ran one by one and it actually added all the content into the file okay so my file is there content is there now let's go ahead and run the command one by one so extract the first names of all students so we know the first name is right here right here see John right here is the first name and then second line Jane third line is Emily fourth line is Michael and fifth line is William so if I wanted to only extract that name from that file I'll do cut minus D because they are separated with a comma and then a uh, single code specify that symbol that you want to have it delimited with or separated with and then code single code close all right and then minus F to specify now that which field do you want from those comma delimited I want the second field okay and now the last is the argument what is the file name you want to get that extraction from you want to get it from students dot text beautiful now hit enter and you will notice that it is giving you the second column or the first name from that file excellent next example I have extract the last name and grade of all so we know the last name is right here Doe, and here's the grade last name is Smith and here's the grade B last name is Johnson and here's a grade a. Now, if you count them, here's the first column, here's the second column, here's the third column, and here's the fourth column. So, by looking at it, we know that we want to extract the third and fourth column. So, we'll do again cut, single quote, comma separated with minus F. Sorry, sing, cut minus D. We have to specify the delimited, <laughs> the comma we are using, okay? And now the field, what field you want? You want third and comma fourth field. Now this comma has nothing to do with comma delimited or delimiter. This is just a comma that's telling it I want field three and four. Very good. And from which file? Students.txt. Beautiful. You see, now we got the third and fourth column. All right. So now if you want the first column, again, you could do hit up arrow key go back to the last command or the first command just change two to one and will give you the first call beautiful now if you want the first two characters or first three characters you could do cut minus C because of the character one two three and one dash three and the file name students and you'll see it give you the first three characters if you want only the first two characters Hit the up arrow key and change from 3 to 2. Hit enter. Now you see every character, sorry, every digit in the first column has 101010. Nice. If you want just the first four, and you see the first four is also had the comma with it. Beautiful. Now if I, I told you if you want the second, first and second, and you only specify the second then it will only pull or extract the second all right that's how the cut command works I want you to go ahead and try with different options try as much many times as you can until you really get a good grip of the cut command if you want to learn more about Linux check out my best-selling course on Linux at udemy.com or you could go straight to my website utclsolutions.com and you will find the exact same course there Hello everyone, in this video we are going to learn another Linux content manipulation command that is a sort command. As it sounds, the sort command is Linux or in Linux is used to sort lines of text and write the sorted results to the standard output. And when I say standard output, meaning once you run the command sort, on a, a text or a file it will output on the screen or on the terminal the basic syntax of the sort command is sort space the file name it's just that simple and the file name of course we are assuming has content inside and then it will sort in alphabetical order whatever inside of that students.txt file okay 
So by the way, I have already created a students.txt file previously. And if you do not have a students.txt file and you're watching this video first time, I'm going to log into my Linux machine. I will show you the content of students.txt file. You could pause this video when I show you, and then you could actually create or add those content into that file. Okay. We will use our existing file, as I said, students.txt that I already have. Um, so the first example would be sort by first name. So if you want to sort our uh, file content by first name, then you could specify the file name at the end and the sort with minus T option. Now T is going to tell the sort that it wanted to sort with minus T option as a delimiter of comma because I have comma as a field separator in that file. Minus K tells it that it's a field number two. All right. If you want to sort by name in reverse order, then you could do sort minus T, same comma delimiter, and minus K, the fourth, um, which is the last column, sort by name in reverse order. Um, so which is, no, which is the third column. By the way, don't focus on which column it is that. Just focus on minus R, which is re in reverse order. Okay, sort and remove duplicate lines. We will add a duplicate line in that file, and then you will see how the sort command will remove those duplicates. However, if you want to run it, you can run sort minus U option with students.txt. Okay, and the, another one is check if the file are already sorted. You can run sort minus T and minus K with minus a one with the first column minus N minus C and students. All right. I'm sure just by going through that doesn't make much sense until we actually log into our Linux machine and go through each of these commands one by one. All right, I have already started up my Linux uh, virtual machine that's running CentOS. Who am I logged in? I'm logged in as myself, which command, I, which directory I'm in. I'm in my home directory. When I do ls minus l, or ls minus ltr, which is to give me everything in reverse order and the latest file that has been created all the way at the bottom, and it does give me students.txt. Now, as I said previously, I'm gonna output a read that file with the cat command, and you will see this file has these contents right here. So, I'm sure you know how to add the the contents of into that student file. So pause this video right now and add this content to that file if you don't already have these contents or that file. All right, once you're done, let's go back and try to manipulate the content. Okay, the first thing is, as I said, sort by first name. So there is, the first name we know is in the second column. We wanted to sort the second column. So for that, we'll do sort minus T, single quote, comma separated, minus K that we're telling it by second field and the student's file, which is the argument. Okay, now you see, here is the output. Here's a command we ran here, here's the output. The output is giving us Emily first, Jane, John, Michael, and William at the end. Okay, so, if you do not sort, you notice it gives us John first. So that's now after sorting, the John moved to the third line. That's what the sort is used for. Okay, sort by name in reverse order. So if I wanted to sort in a reverse order, uh, meaning I want the volume, which is W as an alphabetical, to be the top, then I could run the same command, hit the up arrow key, and I will do simply add minus R here, and it will sort in reverse order. See now, when I ran this command, it gave me this output where William is in, on top, then second sorted alphabet is Michael, then John, Jane, and Emily all the way at the bottom. That's how you sort it in reverse order. Okay, the next one is sort and remove duplicates. Okay, so, if I wanted to 
right now, as you can see, I don't have any duplicates. So what if I add a duplicate? I'll do echo, um, let's say, coat 105, which is the first line, William, comma, Johns, comma, B, okay, double quote close. Then you redirect with double, redirect because it will append it to the file and then students.txt. Okay, we got the command prompt back, which means it works. Let's do cat and read the file. And by reading the file, you see now it has a one line, two line, three line, four, five, six lines now. And fifth and sixth are the duplicates. Excellent. Now, what I want is I wanted to get the output, but I don't want to see the duplicate. So for that, sort minus U and students. Sorry, the file name and hit enter. And here you'll notice it gives you only the five lines, uh, removing the duplicates. See, that's what that sort command becomes so handy and so useful. And the last one is check if the file is already sorted. You could run that command with whatever the, if you sort it, and if it's not sorted, you could put in the option minus N and minus C, and it will tell you if it is sorted or not. So you could actually um, not only sort the file content, but you could also sort the content of an output. For example, you run the command ls minus l. And right here, you notice it gives you this output. The first column, which is about the permission, and the second column, third column, fifth column, and so on. And the file is at the end. Now, you know you already run minus l, which gives you uh, an alphabetical order. Now, the first column is not sorted because if you wanted to have the first column sorted or just the whole output sorted, you could do ls minus l command and use another new command or character, which is a command as well, called pipe, which is a simple straight vertical line, which is right above your enter key. So use a pipe and then simply type sort. Now you see it is actually has sorted the output of another command from the first column. See, it tells you the D is the alphabetical order, should come first, then any other character comes after. And then you see the total at the beginning comes up here. Now it's gonna go move it down. That's how you could sort the output of another command. If you want to learn more about Linux, check out my best-selling course on Linux at udemy.com or you could go straight to my website utclsolutions.com and you will find the exact same course there. In this video, we are going to learn another Linux content manipulation command and that is unique. Unique command in Linux is used to filter out or report repeated line in a sorted file. Typically, unique is used after the sort command, since unique operates on adjacent matching lines. So the basic syntax of the unique command is unique followed by the file name. And we will use as an example, our same students.txt file to run certain commands on uni unique. So examples, we will use our existing file, as I said, and uh, the first example will use remove duplicate lines. So we'll run the command sort and the file name and then pipe it into unique because sort has to sort the file contents first before we run unique. Then count occurrences of each line and that would be sort the file name, pipe it, unique it, with minus C option. And the last one will run display only the lines that have duplicates. So that would be sort uh, the file name, which is students.txt, pipe it, and then we'll unique it with minus D option. All right, so let me start my Linux machine, which I have already up and running as my Linux virtual machine running CentOS. Let's see who am I logged in as. 
I'm logged in as myself, which directory I'm in, I'm in my home, I have salt directory. Okay, very good. So we already have a file called students.txt file. So when I do cat on students.txt file, this is the content inside of this students.txt file. If you do not have that file, you could go ahead and create this file by pausing this video and add all these lines into this file. All right, once you have it, then we could simply do remove duplicate line. So we have these last two lines that are duplicates. So let's say running unique can get rid of that. So sort students. So again, we always have to use use sort in order to remove duplicates so then we'll run unique and you'll see it has removed the last line or the first line or basically both are the same so they removed one of them so that removes the duplicates now if you want to count the occurrences of each line you could do with minus c so hit up arrow key will bring you the last command that you ran and run it with minus c option and right here, it will tell you the first line has appeared once, second once, so on, all the way to fourth is once. And when it comes to fifth, it's telling you there are two lines, the last two lines, that has repeated lines, same lines, duplicate lines. And those are two instances of those lines. All right. Now, if you display only the lines that have duplicates, what if I only wanted to display the lines that are repeated? or duplicates. Simply run the command again by hitting up arrow key and replace minus C option with minus D. And it will tell you this file has this content or this line which is duplicated. So if you just wanted to know what are those lines that are duplicates, you could do it with minus D option. So that's how you run unique command. Very simple tool yet very powerful when you actually have a lot of uh, repeated duplicate lines and you want to get rid, get rid of it, then you could use unique command. But first you have to sort the file, then use the unique command. If you want to learn more about Linux, check out my best selling course on Linux at udemy.com or you could go straight to my website utclsolutions.com and you will find the exact same course there. Hey boys and girls, let's learn WC or sometimes people call it WACA command that lets you do content manipulation. All right, the WC command in Linux stands for word count. It's used to display the number of lines, words, and bytes of a file. It's a simple yet powerful utility that provides counts for text data. The basic syntax of WC command is WC followed by the file name on which you want to get the the number of words, bytes, or count of lines. Some of the examples that we will use, and we'll use our same existing file, students.txt file, which we already have a few content in it. And the first example we'll use get line, word, and byte count. So for that, we'll just simply run wc command followed by the file name. Then the next one is count only the lines. If you just want the number of lines that's inside of a file, then you use minus L option. If you only want to count the number of words a file has, then you would use a minus W option. And similarly, find the length of the longest line, and you could use WC minus uppercase L with students. And by the way, if you wanted to know the bytes, you could use WC with minus, uh, I believe it's uh, C or B, but we'll try it. Anyway, these are the options you could always find out by running the man command. All right, let me go into my Linux machine. And I have it open right here. Let me clear the screen and I'm logged in as myself. I am in my home directory and the file that we're gonna be working on is students.txt file right here. You could get the listing by running the command ls minus ltr. Let's cat the file to see what's inside. We have a, a few entries inside of the file. If you don't, if you do not have that file, simply pause it here and add these content into this file. Okay, so let's try wc students, and it will tell you right here how many lines it has, how many 
uh, words it has and how many um, bytes it has okay now if you wanted to know just the number of lines you could hit up arrow key and specify with minus L and tell you it has six lines total if you count it manually you're gonna see that it does have six lines okay if you want to count the words how many words it has it gives you six now you're probably thinking hmm isn't it has more than one words well it is true but when it comes to Linux and there is no space in the middle, this entire line without a space will be considered as one word. Yes, that's how Linux works. So that's why it's telling you it has uh, six words. If I put a space in there somewhere, then it will count as a separate word. Okay, now if I wanted to count the bytes, so as I said, we could use, I think it's C. Yes. C is the count of bytes, so it's telling you it's 112 bytes. Okay, then the next command I was telling you if you wanted to know, find the length of a longest line, so you do W C uppercase L, then it would tell you that the longest line has a total of 19 um, characters. So I think by looking at it, these are the two longest lines. So pick any one and we'll count 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Yes, you see, if I add more characters or words, let's say on the first line that is longer than this, then it will tell you that the longest line would be this one that has that many characters in it. All right, so that's how you use the WC command very powerful for a word count when you wanted to know, for example, how many lines a, a specific configuration file has or how many lines a log file has. If you want to learn more about Linux, check out my best selling course on Linux at udemy.com or you could go straight to my website utclsolutions.com and you will find the exact same course there. Hello everyone, in this video we are going to learn the awk command which allows you to manipulate the contents of Linux file. Awk command is a powerful text processing tool in Linux primarily used for pattern scanning and data extraction. Awk processes text one line at a time, splitting each line into fields and then executing actions on mash lines or fields. The basic syntax of the awk command is awk, the pattern, and then the action you want to perform, and then the name of the file on which you want to perform that action. So a few examples that we will do on our students.txt file, which we already have created earlier. If you do not have students.txt file, I'll show you on my system, and you could pause the system and actually uh, write or add the content inside of a students.txt file. Okay, so first example is if you want to print the first field, for, for example, student ID from each line of students.txt file, then you could use awk minus f, uppercase f, and then comma because you have to tell that this is a comma delimited, and then print which column you want to print. You want to print the first column and then the students. It works pretty much similar to the cut command as well. Then print names of students who got grade A. We could do awk minus F and then of course we wanted to specify the comma as a, a separator and then we're gonna put dollar four which is the fourth column and we want it to have it grade A equal equal sign. And then once it gets that, then what do you want to do? You want to print that uh, student name, and that student name is in column two. So that's where you're putting dollar two. And then, of course, the last argument is from on which file you want to do that. Then calculate the number of students. You could simply do awk minus f and then comma and print nr and then students. You could do that way, or of course, you could do or you could do wc command as well. 
Okay, I have my Linux machine up and running. The first thing we'll do is we want to print the first field. So um, who am I logged in? I'm logged in as myself. Where am I? I'm in my home directory. Do I have students.txt file? Yes, I do. Right here is the student.txt file. Perfect. Now let's cat the file and see what's inside. Okay, you see right here, here is the content of this file. There are student ID, student name, and their grade. Okay. So if I wanted to just print the first column, which is the student ID, then I have to specify awk, single quote, comma, single quote, space, single quote again, curly braces, print, dollar one, because this is the dollar one right here, which is the first column. That's what it tells dollar one, curly braces, close, comma, from which file? We wanted to get it from students.txt. Oops, I got an error message because, let me see why. Oh, because I did not specify minus F. Oops, sorry, my bad. Uh, minus F. Okay, now it, it should work. There you go, yes. It works perfectly. Now the next thing is print the names of the students who got A grade. Print the first name. So we know the first name is right here, which is the second column, and the grade are on the fourth column. So we have to do is awk dash F. Again, separated. We have to let the awk know that each column is separated by comma. Okay, now single quote again, dollar four because the fourth column is the grade, and we want it to have it equal equal to be grade A. So put that equal equal after whatever that you wanted to put you got to put it in double code then what do you want to do you want to print dollar two because once it finds grade a students then we want what do you want to do you want to display the their first name which is the second column that's why i'm doing print dollar two curly braces close and then single code close because you see we started the single code here and we're closing the single code here as well Always, whenever you start with a single quote, make sure you end with the single quote. Same way, whenever you start double quote, you end with double quote. Okay, then the file name students.txt. And you see, John and Emily are the one who got A grade. See right here, if you look at the file, John is right here. And Emily got A as well. Others got B and C. That's why I didn't get others. Okay, calculate the number of students. We could do awk minus uppercase F, single quote, comma, single quote, then end, curly braces, print, and R, curly braces, close, and then the students, and it tells you there are total six students. You could also count the line, which will also tell you the same thing. So you could either do with awk, or you could have simply done WC minus L, and students will tell you there are six of them. Excellent. All right, so also I wanna tell you something. The awk command doesn't um, only work on a file. It also works on another command's output. For example, let's say you do ls minus l, right? And it gives you the, all the files and directory inside of your home directory. Now, what if you just wanted to get the first column of your output. Well, you could do that simply, ls minus l, then pipe it, awk it, and then single quote print. What do you want to print? The first column and hit enter, and it will give you, see this first column? Same way, let's say if you wanted to only print the last column, that would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that would be eight oh sorry the nine my bad okay now you see it only gives you the file names or directory names so all command can be used on many different things there are many other different uses of all command as well it's very powerful i strongly recommend you that you should try all command with different options also find out what are the different options by running the man command on awk and see what are the different options it has to offer. All right, good luck. 
If you want to learn more about Linux, check out my best-selling course on Linux at udemy.com or you could go straight to my website utclsolutions.com and you will find the exact same course there. Hey folks, in this video we are going to learn another new command that is grep, which is a Linux content manipulation command. Grep is one of the most commonly used commands in Linux systems for searching plain text data sets for lines that matches a regular expression. The name grep stands for global regular expression print. And by reading the, the word grep, you could actually have that thing in your mind that it will go into a file and grab something for you that you are looking for. So the basic syntax of the grep command is grep with its option. There are many options with grep. And then the pattern, which is what you want to grab or grep from the file is the name of the file from that file. If you want to uh, get the line which has a word ABC, then you will type grep ABC from which file. So as an example, we'll take the example and we will use our existing students.txt file. If you do not have students.txt file in your Linux machine, I will log into my Linux machine, show you the content of it so you could create that file by pausing the video. All right, the first thing is uh, if you want to search for students that has a name Jane, then you could just simply do grep Jane and the file name. Let's say you have one, Oh, sorry, let's say you have 1,000 students and you wanted to get the list from the file that has only Jane name in it. Then you could simply do grep Jane space students.txt file, which is the file name. Now, next one, um, what if there are students with uppercase J and lowercase J? Well, you wanted to ignore it, so you will use case insensitive search for the name Jane. And for that, you have to use the option I. So you will use grep minus I space Jane space students. All right, next one is search for lines that do not contain the name Jane, not the grade, sorry, the name Jane. So you will use the minus V option to get every, every student except Jane. Next one is search for lines that with the exact word Jane. So we will use grep minus W for the exact word Jane in the students. So if you want to show only the matched part of the line, meaning if it has Jane Doe or Jane Howard or whatever, you don't want to get the entire line. You only want to get that one specific word that says Jane, then you use, use the option minus O. All right, that's enough theoretical part. Let's go into our Linux machine and let's try these commands one by one. I have my Linux machine already up and running. It is right here. Let me log in. Sorry about that. Okay, so as I said, the first thing you gotta do is to check your if you have students.txt file. Um, I'm logged in as myself, and I'm in my home directory. And when I do ls minus ltr, I'll see I do have student.txt file, which is right here. If I just do cat on it to see what's inside or what's the content of this file, you see these are the content of this file. If you do not have this file, you could pause the video right now, add these content into the file and then you could practice with me but I'm sure if you're following my course then you do have that file okay so first thing is let's say if you wanted to get um, Jane from this file by looking at this file you could tell right away oh yeah there is a Jane here that's good so if if I know that a Jane line appears in the second line then why do I have to run grep command that's a great question if that's what you have. But now this file only have like six or seven lines. What if you have to do the same thing for a file that has, for example, 200,000 lines or 200,000 students? 
then you think you will go through every line by line to find Jane? No, right? That's why the grep command is so powerful that you go in and type grep and Jane and from students and will tell you right here, Jane with the user or student ID 102, last name is Smith with the grade B. Beautiful. What if um, I just go in and I type grep Jane, regardless of uppercase or lowercase from the student's file and hit enter doesn't give me anything, right? It does have a Jane student, but it doesn't give me that Jane. The reason is because the Linux system is a case sensitive system, meaning if you have uppercase, it matters. If you have a lowercase, it matters. You gotta use the right capital words or lower level, le lower level words, lowercase sensitive. So in order to ignore this uppercase and lowercase problem, then you use grep minus i which will ignore uppercase lowercase jane from students and now you see it got got us the result that we were looking for beautiful similarly let's say if you wanted to know how many students um in the students.txt file got a grade you could do simply grep a from students you see it got us two students that has A grade. Now, if you notice that if I just type grep A, lowercase, and then students, hmm, you see, it gave us the name, uh, the actual uh, A that appears inside the name, which is not what you want. That's why I used earlier, I used the uppercase because only the uppercase R in this file represents the grade. Okay, so what if I had a name starting with uppercase A like Adam, then would it is it going to grab that? Of course, yes. Let's say if I'm looking for someone who has e, um, grade E and Emily has E, right? So let's do E students and you'll see it actually grabs for E. So how do I get rid of that problem? Well, you have to put in the, the, the column which we have to tell it the column, fourth column has to be the grade, which we have to put in a sort or, or awk that you could use or different options. All right, now next one is search for lines that do not contain the, the, the name Jane. Okay, I want every student except Jane. Okay, simple as that, grab minus V and Jane and students. Oh, sorry, students.txt, okay. All right, I got the result, but I still have Jane. Why is that? Because again, I did not put case insensitive option. So I have to put grep minus IV or VI combine. And now you'll see it is not giving me Jane. Excellent. All right, moving on to the next one, which is search for lines with the exact word Jane. Okay, so for that grep, W Jane students and it will get the exact word Jane. Now what I mean is even if I do J A N, it will not grep for that just by matching J A N. I am only looking for a word that has exact word W J N. Sorry, with the W option. Going back to the same thing when I was saying that what if I wanted to do E, you could do the same thing by doing grep minus W comma E and then students then it will grep for exact those two letters. All right, show only the match part of the line. So for that grep minus O, Jane, students. So now this is only gonna grep that word that matches what I want. Beautiful. All right, so there are many things that you could do with the grep command. I strongly suggest you, you do man and grep 
and find out what are the different options that are available, what, how the pattern looks like. Also, do some search online to see if you could find more information on the grep. There's also another tool that works alongside with the grep that is eGrep. Um, eGrep is a more powerful tool if you wanted to combine a com, uh, couple of searches together. But definitely look at a look look up for it, and where you will find a lot of information about eGrep. All right, I hope you learned something new from this lesson. I'll see you in the next lesson. If you want to learn more about Linux, check out my best-selling course on Linux at udemy.com. Or you could go straight to my website, utclsolutions.com, and you will find the exact same course there. In this video, we are going to learn and understand how Linux file permissions look like and how do they work. Every file or a directory in any operating system has three types of file permission. First one is read, second one is write, and third one is executable. Or if it's a script, it has to have execution rights. So whether it's Windows, Linux, Mac, or whichever the operating system you're talking about, they will a file directory will have these type of permission. Now, in Linux specifically, these three types of permissions are represented or identified with read for R, just a letter R, write for W, and execute is for X. Now, another thing, every file or directory in Linux has three type of ownership. Okay, that ownership is owner who actually created that file or who's the actual owner of that file. The group, a, a, a user can belong to multiple group. A group can have multiple users. So that's why a group ownership is important. Every time you create a user in Linux, it always have a group as well. Then the third type of ownership is everyone else what we call others. So there are three types of file permissions, read, write, and executable. And they, each of those owner has all these three type, meaning owner can have read, write, and execute. Group can have read, write, and execute. And so are the others who are not owner or the group are considered everyone else as others. Okay, so every file or directory permissions are placed on nine placeholders, which are called bits in Linux. Let me explain you a little more. So when you do ls minus l, when you log in into your Linux system, you see a file or a directory, and the very first column of the file or directory are the permissions. And the permissions will look something like this, as you could see. Now, if you pay close attention, you're going to notice the first three are I have color coded in black, just so you know what I'm talking about. You don't see that color code um, scheme in the actual file system when you log in. I'm just showing you for this for explaining purposes. Okay, so you see the first three, excluding the first bit, which identifies the type of file, whether it's a file or directory or a link or so on. All right, the, the first three, which is read, write, and execute, is for the owner. The second, third, the second three bytes, the one in red, are the for the group, and the third three letter bytes are for others, and they are identified as you for owner so don't confuse o with you o is used for others so when it comes to owner you got to use you to identify that ownership of a file or directory the second one is very simple is a g for group and the third one is others that's why we are not mixing u and o so every time we need to assign permission to a file or a directory, 
and that permission is assigned at a user, a group, or others level, then we could uh, we could choose these letters, these identification reference letters, UGO, to change their permissions. That's why I wanted to bring this up. So again, pay close attention. There are nine placeholders or called bits in Linux to identify or set the promotion, uh, uh, permissions. All right, let's log in and view our permission in our Linux system. Okay, so I have my Linux machine open here. Okay, let me log in. Okay, I'm logged in. I'm logged in as myself and I type who am I, which directory I am in. I am in my slash home slash I have solved directory, which is the home directory. Beautiful. Okay, so now if I do ls command and hit enter, you will notice I only see the files and directories, um, but I don't see all the properties that are associated with each file and directory. So in order to see the properties or all the metadata of that file or directory, you do ls minus l, ltr, or whatever the options you want to specify. Hit enter. And right here, you're going to see the files and the directories all the way to the right. And all the way to the left, every column represents something. The first column is the permission column. That's the one we are talking about. And that's the main focus for this video. So let's say the first file right here is ABC. And this file permission is right here, which is the first column. Now, this permission tells us that this is a file because you see it doesn't have D in front of it. So this is a file we know for sure. Now, the first three bytes starts with read, write, and dash, meaning the user or the owner of this file has read and write permission and does not have executable permission. So, which means this file is a regular text file and not a script. Okay, good. Then the next three bytes right here is for the group, which means this these permissions are given to group. So, only read permission is given to group because it only has read. There is no write. There is no execute, which for X. So that's why it has dash dash. Okay, the last one right here, the last three bits is for everyone else but user and group. So that has a pretty much, not pretty much, exactly the same permissions, which is only read, no write, and no execute. So that's how you identify a file or directory permission. If you go to a directory, let's say here is one directory, its directory name is desktop, you could tell the directory has D, which identifies it as a directory. Then the first three permissions are read, write, execute, meaning the user who owns it, which is I of Zol. See right here, I of Zol. This user owns the directory and has read, write, and execute permission. Okay, now you're probably thinking this is a directory, then why a directory is a has execution script uh, permission when it's not a script? That's a great question. Well, to tell you that, the reason each directory got to have an execution because if you want to CD inside of this directory, then that directory has to have that executable permission to it. If you don't have that execution permission on a directory, then you cannot CD into that directory. It's just that simple. Okay. So the owner of this directory has all three permission, meaning the owner can read the content of this directory, what's inside. The owner can add more files, delete files because it has a write um, permissions, then execute the owner can CD into the directory. Beautiful. Now let's go to group. Now group has two permissions. See right here? Nope. Right here. It has read permission, meaning it could uh, view the content of the 
di directory and it has execute meaning it could cd into that directory but once the group user or group can go into the directory cannot delete or add any more files directories inside of that directory okay then the last three permissions same way and that is given to everyone else or others which is also read and execute only no write permission excellent so that's what actually i wanted to tell you there is one file right here which has which is not a directory and it's a regular file and it has execution permission you see right here x and there's another x and there is another x meaning this file is not a regular text file this file is a script yes you could execute that script and that's why you identify it as with xx if you take out this x from others meaning anybody who is in that group and anybody who, or the user or owner itself can only execute that as a script and no one else can execute it all right guys that's pretty much about understanding our file permissions linux file permissions that's very very important sometimes a lot of system administrator try to delete a file and they get an error message they try to create a file inside of a directory they get an error message so the reason they get it because they don't have the right permissions so why they why don't they have a right permission how could they assign the right permission for that they need to know what kind of permission they have and that's why it was important for me to bring you this lesson all right great i will see you in the next video if you want to learn more about linux check out my best-selling course on linux at udemy.com or you could go straight to my website utclsolutions.com and you will find the exact same course there hey folks in this video, we are going to learn a Linux file system security management. File system security is applied to files and directories to prevent unauthorized access. So if you have a file or a directory on your computer and you do not want anyone else to open it or delete it, then you have to put some kind of permissions, right? That's exactly what we will talk about in this video. So the command, which is chmod and it is often sounds or pronounced as chmod command in linux is used to change the permission of files and directories it stands for change mod it can be used to grant or revoke permissions to owners which are the users of that file the groups group that owns that file or everyone else or we call it others there are two ways to specify permissions with the change mod command. So you use symbolic mode, which uses letters, such as a read for R, W for write, and X for execute to specify permissions. Then there's octal mode, which uses three digit number to specify permission. For example, if you wanted to give a read write permission to a file using symbolic mode and you wanted to give that permission to everyone to users group and others you use chmod c u g o meaning user group others plus meaning giving permission minus would be taking away the permission and what are the permissions you we are giving we are giving read write and execute permission to which file to any file in my case is we, we just calling it my file my file now if you're using octal mode then you will use change mod space 777 for the exact same permission to that file now you're probably wondering where can you get these numbers exact numbers well i'm sure there are many calculators online you could you could find that will give you these exact numbers or octal mode numbers and I'm sure there are many people who have been in, in IT or in Linux, they, over time, with experience, they actually remember these numbers. All right. There are two commands used to set file or directory ownership. Now, who owns that file? Now, before change mod, we're talking about how to assign, give, take permissions of that file. 
in this one we are talking about who, how we could change the ownership of that file so the two command that are used is a chgrp that is if you want to change the group of a file then you use the command is change group the name of the group you want to give it to the ownership and the name of the file file name similarly if you want to change the ownership of the file you use change own chown the new username you want to give the uh, all the ownership to and the name of that file okay now let's log into our linux machine and go through assigning these permission so we will practice together because without practicing you cannot really understand how we could assign permissions in linux system all right here is the list of every step that we will take in our linux machine one by one i'll we'll do it together okay let me bring up my linux machine right here okay i am logged in now how or which user am i logged in as who am i i'm logged in as myself which directory am i in i am in slash home slash i absolve good now which host name am i logged in host name make sure you whatever you're doing whichever system you're doing you always run host name so you will know exactly that you are logged into the right system sometimes we want to try certain things on development environment and with the slight mistake we could log into production and make changes to all right okay so now let's try these commands that i have listed one by one so let me move this to the right a little like this and move this window terminal inside closer all right so first log in as i absolve and create a new file that is data core okay we already confirmed i'm logged in as i absolve and here now we will create a file called data core so what is the command we'll use to create a file touch data core okay now how do we verify it, it is created ls minus l and you will see right here is data core and if you run the command ls minus ltr then you will see the most recent file created all the way at the end which is one of my favorite command ls minus ltr so it will tell me right here on reverse order all right so the file is created excellent now the next instruction is give a read write permission at group level so right here we are giving read and write read give read write permissions at group level so just by looking at the permissions we could tell it already has read so we actually only have to give write permission at the group level so what we'll do is chmod and we want to give it at group level so we'll type g and we are giving the permission so it will be plus and what permission we're giving we are giving read and write now if it already has a read permission which it does then it will not do anything or even it will not take away the existing permission so it will make sure it is there if not then it will give if it's not then it will just simply ignore all right so we'll do g group plus rw and to which file we wanted to give it to data core hit enter okay we got the prompt back without any error message it means it worked now how do we verify if it got the right permission right here if it got the right permission we have to run the command ls minus ltr hit enter and you will see right here the permission read and write at the group level has been assigned beautiful if you are following the exact same uh, commands and we are running together then perfect okay next third instruction it says take out read permission at others level okay so right now here is the other level and the other level does have the read permission so it's saying take that out okay beautiful we'll try that chmod 
And how do we identify others? We identify others with O. And now this time we're taking it out. So we'll choose minus. And what are we taking out? Read. So we will do R. Space. Now data core, which is the name of the file, which actually we are working on. Hit enter. Okay. We got the prompt back. How do we verify it worked? Again, LS minus LTR. And now you see the last three bits has nothing on it. See right here. This is the last three bits, sorry, last three bit at others level and nothing is assigned. So it means our command worked perfectly. All right, moving on. Step number four, take out the right permissions at user and group level. Okay, do we have right, right, right permission here? Yes. See, owner has it and group has it too. So in instruction number four, it's asking us to take these out. Okay, we'll do it. CHMOD, we're taking out at user level and group level and taking what out? Minus W, which is the right permission. Off of which file? Data core. Enter. Let's verify it by running ls minus ltr command. And there you will have it. The W is gone from here and the W is gone from here as well. Okay. Moving on, step number five, take out read permissions at group level. So it does have a read permission right here. This is a group level. So it's saying take that R out, read. Okay, we'll do that. So change mod group minus read. Okay, data core. Verify it. Ah, see, it has actually taken out everything from group as well as everything from others. That was just instruction number five. Number six, take out read permissions at user level. Okay, so the only permission we have left is the read at the user level. It says take that out too. Okay, let's do that. Same command, change mod. Let me hit enter so it's easier to see the command. Change mod. User is you minus read to data core file. Hit ls minus ltr, and now you'll see it has no permission at all. <laughs> okay, so nobody could read it, nobody could write it, nobody could execute it. It's simple flat. All right, now let's go to seven. Give read permission to everyone. Okay, now let's give read permission to everyone. So we'll do change mod. We could do everyone as user group others plus read data core that's one way of doing it or the other way you could do is instead of ugo we could just simply do a which means all everyone that we said which is user group and others so we could use a and hit enter let's verify it and you will see now it has a read at the user level read at the group level and read at others level okay number eight give write permission at user level so it's saying basically give write permission right here at the user level okay change mod user plus write data core hit enter let's verify it it has it okay number nine suppose it's a script Okay, let's suppose give executable permission to only user and group. Okay, so let's try that. So we are going to assign executable permission at the user and group level right here only. So for that, we'll do change mod user group giving permission is plus and we are giving executable permission to which file to data core. All right, we got the prompt back. Let's verify it. LS minus LTR. And you'll see the, the color change because it's no longer a flat text file. It's a script now. That's how it sees it. That's a script, even though it's not, but that's fine. Since we have assigned the executable permission at user, user and group level, that's why it's, it, it is showing as executable. 
Now you see this is the X at the user that is assigned. Now so you see this is the X at group that is assigned. Okay, number 10, give executable permission to others as well. Okay, it asks us to give others as well. Why well, leaves others out, right? <laughs> okay, and that is X and data core. How do you verify it? And now others, excellent, others has executable permission too. Number 11, take out executable permissions from everyone. Okay, we gave it, now let's take it out. Again, we are doing this practice, that's why I have some of the steps back and forth, so I want you to learn everything about assigning permissions to files and directories. Okay, again, take out executable permissions from everyone. Everyone, we could do again, UG, others or simply a minus executable data core and verify it and you'll see now xxx from everyone is gone and the file is back to flat file all right uh, number 12 change the group ownership to root so right now you see this file data core is owned by ifsol and the group is also owned by IFSL. So in number 12, it's saying change the group ownership to root, meaning it's saying from this IFSL, this group should be root. Okay, so in order to change any file permission to anyone else, or more specifically, the root, you have to be root because you cannot give permission or assign permission, anything to root. Only root can do it. So for that, we have to become root, su dash, provide the root password. Okay, it is provided. Now let's go into my home directory, which is slash home slash ifsol, because by default, if you log in as root, it will keep you, or it will take you to its root directory, which is, this is the root home directory. We want to go to slash home slash ifsol, in that directory, we are working with data core file, which is right here. Now it's saying change the group to root. So for that changing group, ownership will use the command change grp group. What is the new newer group name now? Root. And what would be the file that we wanted to change the ownership of is data core. Hit enter. We got the command back, which means it works. How do we verify it? Run ls minus ltr command, and you will see now it has the group ownership of root. Before it had ifsol, now group root owns it. Uh, instruction number 13, change the file ownership to root as well. So right now, this is the file ownership ifsol. It's saying change that to root as well. Of course, only root can do it. ifsol cannot do it. So we'll run now change ownership to root of data core file. Let's verify it. Now this file is owned by root and the group ownership is also by root. By the way, when I say group ownership, which means the root, there's a group name called root as well. And there's a user uh, name that is called root as well. All right, let's move on to number 14. Now, as I have Zal, write to a file using echo command, okay? Become I have Zal. So exit out of root. Okay, I'm logged out. Uh, who am I? I am I have Zal. Where am I? I am in slash home I have Zal directory. And let's make sure I have that file in it, data core. Yes, it does have it. In number 14, it's saying now as I have Zal, write to a file using echo command. Write to this file, okay? Let's say I wanted to do echo and I wanted to type, let's say, hello world. And I wanted to redirect that output to data core. Ah, permission denied. Why the permission denied? Because, first of all, I am IFZAL. I do not own this file. I, my group is IFZOL, and IFZOL does not own that file. Okay, so it means I do not fall into this category because I'm not the owner of the file. The root is the owner. Then the second 
third bits are I do not fall in this category either because this is for group I fall in others because I am others now and being other I could only read the file but I cannot write to that file that's why it gave me that permission denied you see now you understand how permissions are important for not to have anyone access some of your important files okay so that's the purpose of number 14. Now, number 15, as I have all give write permissions to others. Okay. If not, then give it as root. Okay. So first give it a write permission to others of this file of data core. Okay. Do you think I could give write permission to that file? Well, let's find out. In order to give write permission, change mod to others plus write to data core what do you think if you say no then you are absolutely right because you cannot give right permission because you do not own the file that's why you cannot do anything with this file it says per operation not permitted okay so it says right right here in the instruction if not then give it as root okay so Let's go in as root, login as root, go to home, I have Zol. Let's verify the file is there. Now as root, we will give others the permission of write to that file. That's verified. All right, and now the owner has read and write permission. The group only has write permission, sorry, only has read permission, and others or everyone else has read as well as write. Okay, good, it worked. 15, uh, no, 16. Now, again, as I have Zal, write to a file using the echo command. Okay, now let's log out from root. Make sure we are I have Zal, which directory we are in. Is the file there? Yes. Now it's saying, now go ahead and write to that file again. So we're going to do the same command, echo, hello world, and output to data core. Ah, this time it took it. Why? Because I, as anyone or other user, because I right now, I have Zal, is considered as other. So me being other has the right permission to write into that file. Okay, now I have already written to that file. Now, can I read that file? Yes, I can because I also have read permission. You see right here? So let's do cat. Uh, let's hit couple of enter. So we have right screen to see. Cat data core and now you'll see you could also read what's inside of the file that you have written in step number 16. Okay, step number 17, as root, change the ownership of the file back to IFSOL. Okay, so in order to change the ownership of this file from root to IFSOL, again, I cannot take away the ownership from root. Only root can do it. Even if I try to, let's say, change owner, I have Zal of data core. See, it says operation not permitted. It's telling me you are not root. You cannot take away that ownership from root. Only root can do it. Okay, so let's become root. Now go to home, I have Zal directory. Now do change own I have Zal of data core file. Let's do ls minus ltr and now you'll see I have Zal is the owner and who is the group of this uh, group ownership of this file is data core. So we did change it as root change the ownership of file back to I have Zal. We did. The last step to do is delete the file as I have Zal. Can you? Now, that's the question before I delete it. Do you think I could delete that file? Let's see if I have only people who have write permission can delete that file. So, 
I have Zal can delete the file. Of course it can because I have Zal owns the file and as the owner has doubly permission. Well, if I were not I have Zal, I was anyone else, I would still able to delete it because others can delete the file too. Okay, so let me exit out. And to delete a file, the command is rm data core and it is gone. And of course, this is Linux. We don't get the confirmation saying, hey, you command, your command ran beautifully and it worked. No, it, it just gives you the prompt back, which means it did work. So how do you verify ls minus ltr? And you'll see the data core file is no longer there. Okay, guys, that's how we wanted to cover how you could assign uh, permissions to your Linux uh, files and directories, and that is for file system security management. If you want to learn more about Linux, check out my best-selling course on Linux at udemy.com, or you could go straight to my website, utclsolutions.com, and you will find the exact same course there. Hey, boys and girls, in this video, we are going to learn a Linux user account management. Of course, Linux is a multi-user environment operating system in which there are many users are being created and managed. So that is why it is very important for you to learn how you could create user accounts and how you could manage those user accounts as well as their groups. Linux user account management is the process of creating, modifying, and deleting user accounts on a Linux system. User accounts are used to control who has access to the system and what resources they are allowed to use. There are several different commands that can be used to manage user accounts in Linux. Now, the most common commands are as follow. The very first one and the most commonly used one in order to create user account is a user add. This command creates a new user to Linux system. If you want to delete that same user or any other user, you could use the command user del, D-E-L for delete. And same thing, if you wanted to create a group in Linux, you could use the command group add and to delete, it will be group del or delete. Now, if you wanted to modify a user or existing user, of course, you can use the command user mod. This modifies an existing user account. And the last thing in our list is the id command which is used to get user and its group information. So if you wanted to know user ABC or Jerry, then you could run the command ID space Jerry and it will give Jerry's username, group name, user ID, group ID, and so on. But we'll try that in our Linux machine as we log in. So. Next thing we'll do is we'll log into our Linux system and we will try all these 15 commands one by one. Okay, let me start up my Linux machine. Okay, now the first thing we have to do is to make sure our Linux machine is up and we have our command prompt or terminal is open. Of course, command prompt is always at the blinking cursor the first thing we have to do is create a new user called Elon Musk. Okay, cool. So in order to create a user in the Linux system, you have to be root. Yes, you cannot be a regular ordinary user. No matter what kind of permission you have, you cannot create a new user to the system. Only the root has the key to let or create users in Linux. Okay. So for that reason, become root, because right now you are, who am I? You are ifzol, you're logged in um, to your home ifzol directory. Let's go and become root. Okay, we are logged in as root. How do we know? We could do who am I, and it tells you root. And of course, my prompt has changed 
from pat dollar sign to hashtag okay which directory am i in i am in slash root directory okay the first thing we have to do is create a new user called elon musk okay well to do that we'll do user add and the id that we wanted to pick for that is uh, e musk that's usually a corporate standard in which uh, your first name initial is used uh, with your complete last name so first name initial is e and the complete last name is musk okay now the user is created and as always linux will not tell you hey your user is created you're good no it will just give you the prompt back now in order for you to verify if that user id or user account is created you can run the command id emusk and it will tell you if the account exists yes it does with user id 1002 and the username is emusk it's group id and when you don't specify the group it automatically creates the group with the same name emusk with the group ID which is similar to user ID or if it's not available to the next number that is in Etsy password file which I'll go through in just a second then it is the groups 1002 that's what it's telling you in the group now um, when you create a user another way to confirm that user is created is by looking at its user file so every time a user is created, its entry is added into a file called Etsy password. And that is, let's cat that file, slash etc Etsy, and password is not the full password command or the password word, it is the pass WD. And hit enter. And every time a new user is created, it gets created all the way at the end of the file. So if you look at the file on the top, the file starts always starts with root. Root has a user ID of zero and group ID of zero. Always start with that. Then as the accounts are created, they are created at the bottom. So right here, you see the last line? We created eMusk and it's telling you the first column is the name uh, or username of that user account. X stands right here here identifies its encrypted password you cannot see that 1002 is the user ID that was picked by the system and it's going by the order it saw that the last user ID that was created was 1001 so it's going to increment to that number and 1002 similarly for group ID from 1001 to 1002 this call this column is empty you see there's a colon and colon nothing in between this is basically the description of the user if you want to specify if you don't that's fine then there is home slash emusk this is the home directory that is created for this user and assigned to this user every time this user is logged in this user will get this home directory by default and when the user will do pwd it'll see that it has this directory the last thing this one is the slash bin slash bash which means that this is the shell environment will be given to this user as that user will log in now if i try to log in that user it will not let me log in because i have not set up its password yet so every time you create a password if you want the user to log in make sure you provide or give password to that user and for that you have to give the command password space emusk stands for the username of course hit enter and now it's going to ask you to change the password let's put the new password and it says bad password the password fails the dictionary check it is based on a dictionary word it's fine this is our lab environment so we're gonna just give go with the same simple password that we are picking for this user okay all authentication tokens updated successfully which means the password is set for user emusk can be verified yes of course you could do let's exit out of root now I am logged in as a regular user I absolve. Now if I wanted to switch to eMusk, I could do u switch user dash 
Now the username eMusk. Hit enter. Now it is asking you to enter the eMusk password. And that is, I'm sure you know that. And that is the password that you picked when you created the, the password. Okay, so now you are logged in. Who am I as I e Musk? Okay, very good. Uh, now, if you want to get out of this account, you could just simply do exit and you are back as who am I? I have Zon. Now, if you wanted to log in as root, you could go back as root, su dash, enter the password, and your password is entered. Perfect. Now, the next thing is create a second user, Bill Gates. Now, this one. We're creating with user ID 2000. We want to specify the user ID 2000 this time because we are picking the user IDs. And for that, we'll do user add. To specify the user ID, you use minus a U option. Then you will do the user ID specification right here. And then the, the username. And we're picking the username as B Gates. Okay, it is created. How do you verify cat at C password? And you will see the last line indicates that the user is created with the username bgates and user ID 2000, the one that we specified. Excellent. Third instruction, create third user Steve Jobs. Okay, and we are creating this third user Steve Jobs with the home directory instead of slash home slash username which is s jobs i wanted to create slash home slash steve okay for that we'll do user add minus d option and that would be slash home slash steve then the username s jobs okay now how do we verify it again cat at c password and Right here, this tells you the username, the user ID 2001. You see it picked the next incremental user after the last one that it saw in that file. The home directory is slash home slash Steve. Okay. And the uh, environment is a shell that is given to it is bin bash. If I wanted to log in and confirm that we are inside of this directory, then before we log in, we have to set the password for Steve Job, which is J S Jobs. Let's put in the password. Okay, now let's go ahead, exit out of root, and let's go into S Jobs. Put in the password. Who am I? We are S Jobs. Which directory am I in? My home directory slash home slash Steve. See, we specified the directory, and now it's taking that directory as its home directory. Beautiful. Okay, now let's go back to our root. Okay, the fourth is create a fourth user, John Brown. Okay, user add with user ID J Brown. Okay, how do you verify? You could just simply do ID J Brown and you'll see their incremented user ID 2002. Okay, enough with creating user accounts now let's create a new group called accounts for that we'll run group add accounts now how do we verify this one we could just simply go to cat etsy groups just like there is a file to which manages the user accounts that there is another file called etsy group which manages the group hit enter and oops sorry not groups just the group okay so hit enter and you will see at the end of the line it created the group accounts with the ID one incremented to the last one. Next is step instruction number six, create a new group infotech. Okay. For that group add infotech. That is created. How do we verify it? Cat Etsy group. And Infotech is there with incremented number 2004. Okay, beautiful. Next one. Um, instruction number seven, delete user S jobs. Okay, 
If you want to delete a user S job, you have to run the command user del S jobs. Hit enter. Okay, how do we verify? Let's do ID S job. It says no such user account. Okay, no such user. Also, let's make sure it's not in the file Etsy password. And you see S job is not there. These are the three last ones we created. Okay, next one is delete a group accounts. Now it's time to delete a group as well. For that, we'll do the command group del accounts. It is gone. Let's verify. And you see it's not there. Okay, number nine, add a user B gates to Infotech group. Okay, we wanted to add that user to not only its own group, which is B gates, it, this is its own group. We wanted to also add that user to B Infotech group. And for that, we'll run the command user mod minus uppercase G Infotech, which is the name of the group that we are trying to add the user into. And which user is B gates? It is added beautiful. Let's verify B gates. And it'll tell you it is part of the B gates group as well as Infotech group. You could also do CAD Etsy group, and you'll see the Infotech also has B gates in there, and B gates has its own B gates anyway. All right, next one is number 10 add a user eMusk to Infotech group as well. Okay, we'll do that for eMusk as well. Uh, user mod minus G Infotech, uh, and that is. E musk okay it's there let's verify it okay there you go so b gates and e musk are both part of infotech group all right very good now let's go to change the username b gates to bill gates okay if you want to or if you have a user for a while and let's say that user says you know what can you change my user id to a different id that you know, the user likes, okay, we could go into user mod and minus L option is the one that we will use. And then a new username, which is Bill Gates, and then specify the old username or the user account. It is done. How do we verify IDB Gates? Of course, there's no such user with that ID now. Now let's do ID Bill Gates, new user ID, and that's when it tells you everything about bill gates okay next one is lock user j brown so let's say if you want to um if you we already have a, a user that we created j brown right idj brown yes we do we want to lock that user so it won't be able to lo log in for that we'll use the command user mod minus l and j Brown, sorry, user mod minus L J Brown. It is locked. Okay, if you wanted to unlock it, you could use the same thing user mod minus U J Brown and it will unlock it. Unlocking the user password would result in passwordless account because we never set up the password for J Brown. Uh, you should set password with the user mod p to unlock the user account oh okay so we did not create it, its password or give it password so it's saying in order for you to unlock you could run this command user mod minus p to unlock but anyway my point is not to really unlock or lock it my point is to show you what other commands you could use to lock and unlock okay next command number 14 set user bill gates account expiry date to December 31st, 2025. Okay, so if I want a Bill Gates account to expire or not be able to log in after December 31st, 2025, then I could do that definitely. And for that, we'll run the command user mod minus E. Now specify very first thing is year, dash, then the month, dash, then the date. Then the name of which user account you're specifying Bill Gates. Okay, done. It means on this date, the account will be locked. No longer Bill Gates will be able to log in. Now, 
last one is remove Bill Gates from Infotech Group. What if you wanted to remove Bill Gates from Infotech Group? Remember we added um, B Gates or Bill Gates to Infotech? Now it's saying instruction number 15, remove it. For that, we cannot use user mod. I'm going to show you a new command which you could use to perform that function, which is G password minus D option that is used and to remove it, Bill Gates from Infotech. Okay, it says removing user Bill Gates from group Infotech. Done. Can be verified. Group. And yes, Infotech now only has Elon Musk and it does not have Infotech. Okay. Um, also, make sure all the users are in there uh, that we created. You could always go to password file and you see all these users are gone. We, we deleted uh, Steve Jobs. Of course, let's say if people leave the company or uh, for example, in this case, a piece um, uh, may Steve Jobs rest in peace. He's no longer with us. So there are always this type of situations when we have to go in and delete users or lock their account. So that's why we could use delete user, delete, um, use a delete command to delete them. So they no longer with the company or they don't exist in the uh, Linux system. We have verified here as well that Steve Job does not exist. All right. All right, uh, folks, uh, this, these are the list of commands we tried. The main purpose of this video is that you understand how you could manage a Linux user accounts um, when you get to the system administration role. Good luck. If you want to learn more about Linux, check out my best-selling course on Linux at udemy.com or you could go straight to my website, utclsolutions.com, and you will find the exact same course there. Hey boys and girls, in this video we are going to learn Linux File Editor. So Vim is a highly customizable and extensible text editor that is popular among developers and system administrators. So not just system administrator, developers also use a Vim editor. It is known for its powerful features and efficient workflow. Vim is available for free and open source software for many operating systems, including Linux. Of course, it is available in Linux. If you install Linux operating system in your environment, you do not have to install Vim separately. It comes with it. Then it is available in Mac OS and even for Windows operating systems as well. Vim has a different modes for different tasks. There are two main modes under Vim Editor. First one is Command Mode. Pay close attention. Command Mode, you can use keyboard shortcuts to move around the document, edit text, and perform other functions. We'll go over it, of course, to show you how Command Mode works. The second mode is Insert Mode which is to insert, you could type text into the document. Okay, so here are some basic examples of how to use a Vim editor. If you wanted to move around the document or navigate around the document while you are inside of a file, then you could use H, move one character to the left. Now these are navigation commands like up, down, left, and right arrow keys. Sometimes you could also use up, down, and left and right arrow keys, that's fine. But it's best that you remember these keys. Then you have J to move one character down. Then K, move one character to, the, to up. Then L, move one character to the right. Okay, then in order to get into the edit text, then you could use I, just hit I key on your keyboard and it will get you in the insert mode of the Vim editing the file. A, if you instead of I, 
you just hit A, it will also get into your insert mode, but in this case, it will append text after the cursor where your cursor is blinking. O will open a new line below the cursor. Uppercase O open a new line above the cursor. X is to delete a character under that cursor. DD, you have to hit twice, DD is to delete the line under the cursor. Then U, to undo the previous change. Let's say if you accidentally deleted the entire line and that was not your intention, you could just simply hit U key to bring that action last action back. Then there is a command mode, which is to escape, escape out of insert mode. So when you hit I, you will be in insert mode and you're going to be typing and everything. But if you wanted to get out of that, simply hit escape on your keyboard. Then if you wanted to save the file, you do colon W. If you wanted to quit the file without saving, then you will just do colon Q. And now if you wanted to save as well as quit, then you could use colon W and Q and hit enter. Okay, so I wanted to tell you some of the online resources that you could go to and practice Vim Editor. And that those online resources give you kind of a fun type of environment where you could learn a Vim Editor a lot easier. Okay, and by the way, all of them are free. So there is openvim.com, Vim.is, Vim Genius, Vim Dash Adventures, and Vim Ninja. Let's try logging into our Linux system and practice Vim together. And here are a few things that we will practice them one by one. Okay, excellent. Now, who am I logged in as? I'm logged in as I have solved. Which directory I'm in? I'm in my home directory. Perfect. Which host or which Linux machine am I logged in to? Host name, Linux CentOS. Make sure this is the right one that you want to get into or supposed to get in. So first thing first, it says log in as IFZOL and create a text file using echo command. So remember, there are two ways that you could create a file. One by echo something and outputting that to a file. So for example, It has created a file. How do we know? Let's do ls minus ltrc all the way at the bottom. Here is the file that it created. Let's cat that file just to make sure it has all the contents that we're looking for. Yes, it does. Excellent. So our first instruction is done. Now, next thing is running Vim Editor. Oh, now things gonna get nice and technical. Uh, so simply run a Vim and check out the editor option. Okay. So let's simply run Vim without doing anything and hit enter. Type colon Q to exit if I wanted to get out of this Vim editing mode. Or colon help for online help. And colon help the space version if you wanted to know the version. So that's just information. If I wanted to save this what I am in right now, I could do colon quit W, meaning save the file and quit the file. And hit enter and you will say it tells you no file name why is that is because when i ran the vim command i should have specified the file name that i wanted to create and edit which i did not so in that case we'll just simply quit out of it okay so we are outside of vim editing mode now see now we have a command we are, we are in the command line where we could run commands like a pwd, cd, uh, ls minus ltr. This is a regular mode of Linux. If you type vim, followed by the file name, it will take you inside of the vim editing. And you need to know certain commands to get out of it. Okay, and we'll cover that one by one. Next is thing is, an, in running vim editor, instruction number two, create a new file called to do dash list dot text using vim command okay let's keep this a little here about here okay that's good now for that i am going to do vim to do dash list dot text hit enter 
Okay, now I am in the file name to do list.txe. It's telling me the file name as well. And as I am moving around, it will also tell me exactly where my cursor is. Now, next step is a third instruction, quit Vim. Press escape to ensure you are in normal mode. Let's type that. Hit escape. Okay, we are escape. Normal mode. Then type quit colon Q and press enter. Okay, so let's do that. Colon Q and press enter. Okay, now let's go into the insert and saving a file. So first thing is enter insert mode. Press I insert before the cursor and so on. But before getting into the insert mode, we have to go back into the Vim editing and do to do dash list dot txt hit enter. Now at this time we are in Vim editing mode. Sorry, in Vim editor, but we are not in actually editing or insert mode where we could type anything. So in order for you to type something, hit I. As soon as it hit I, you're going to see right at the bottom left, it tells you you are now in insert mode. If you want to get out of insert mode, simply hit escape and it will get you out of insert mode. See, it's, it's no more in insert mode. Again, if you wanted to go back into insert mode so you could add some content, hit I. Okay, now you are in insert mode and it's saying the second step is add contents using the insert mode. I have some content that I will add it with you guys to do list. Okay, and we could just do equal sign to take it as underline. So number one, we're going to do grocery shopping. And as you can see, as you are typing, it's just simple as if you are typing on a regular notepad. Now, if you find this a little annoying, it's okay while I'm typing. I understand you could just simply go ahead and fast forward. This is the content that I wanted to add inside of the Vim editing. Okay, let me minimize this now. Now you see, I am already in insert mode. Now, now I have done creating my to-do list. Now I wanted to get out of this file after saving it. So in order to get out, you first have to hit escape. So you could get out of insert mode, hit escape. Okay, now you're out. Now I want you to hit sh shift colon, which is actually the colon, right, Q, and hit enter. And it has saved, it has created to do dash list dot text file, as well as it has saved all, everything that we typed inside of that file. Okay, which was step number four, save, press escape, then type W and press enter. If I had only typed a W and entered, then it would have saved, but it would still had been inside of the Vim editor. If I had typed WQ and hit enter, it gotten me out, save the file. By the way, some people use a colon WQ or some people simply use uppercase ZZ which does the exact same thing as colon WQ saves it and exit out of it. Okay, now the file is uh, saved. Now let's verify if it actually uh, added those contents that we were adding to do list. Let's do cat and you'll see, yes, it does have all the contents that we added. Excellent. Now let's go inside of the file again. And let's do some navigation. Let's move around. So Vim, to-do list, hit enter. And now you see where we left our cursor last time. It is still there blinking. Now, if you wanted to, let's say, move to the left, then you would use H key on your keyboard. See, H, 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 H. I'm hitting H key right now, and it's moving to the left. 
if I wanted to uh, go down, then I would hit J key that it will go down. But if I do it now, you see there is nothing to go there. There isn't any more lines to go down to. So it's not really going to work. So instead, what we'll do is we'll use K key to go up. So I'm going to hit K, 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 K. See, I'm going up. Now, if I wanted to go down, now I could use J key. So coming down, J, 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 J. You see, right now, I'm only able to navigate and use these keys because I am not in insert mode. Because I'm telling you again, if you type I right now, which is insert mode. See, it came insert mode. Now, if you type H to move your cursor to the left, look what will happen. It will think that you're actually typing the letter H instead of navigating. So in order for you to navigate around your content, first make sure you get out of this insert mode. And in order to get out of this insert mode, hit escape and it will get you out. See, it's out. Now you could use the K key again to go up. See, up, up, up. And you could use the L key to go right. Right, see? There you go. And if you wanted to go back to the left, go H. And now I am using my up key, up arrow keys, up, down, left, right arrow keys to move around. You could use that too. It in some cases it is allowed you could go and move around freely but in some uh, unix type of operating system and you're using vim it might not allow you to do that so it's better that you learn the h j k and l keys to maneuver or navigate around your content also if you want to let's say if you want to jump around the words so like in uh, navigation in, in instruction number two of navigation if you want to use jump the next word so let's say i am on right here on a call on this call word and i want to move to the next word i'll use w see it jumped to the next word again w it jumped to the next word see that's to expedite if you wanted to go and do the insert things also, if you wanted to go to the beginning of the word, let's say you are right here in the middle of plumber and you wanted to go at the beginning, you would type B and it will bring you back to the first letter of that word. Okay, similarly, if you wanted to go to the end of the word, simply type E and it will take you to the end of the world end of the word sorry not world i'm sorry if i sounded that um hope there's no end of the world very soon while we're here okay anyway that's about the navigation once again you want to go down but you use j you want to go up k you want to go right l you want to go left which is h and all these keys if you notice are right next to each other so it becomes very easier to move around Okay, next thing we will learn is about editing. For that, let's say delete characters. So first of all, let's say if you are in insert mode. First of all, if you type something now, it will actually type on the screen. But if you wanted to delete this word or character, you have to get out of insert mode. And for that, you hit what? Escape. Yes, escape key. Hit escape. Now, if you wanted to delete uh, a character, I type check the shower head, just get rid of the. So that would be three times X, 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 C. Check shower head, simple as that. Now, if you have this already taken care of, for example, and you don't want this line to be part of call the plumber and you just want to get rid of the, this entire line, what do you do? You delete the entire line by hitting DD. So DD right after each other, DD. So you got rid of the entire line. Uh, then you realize, huh, was uh, deleted by mistake. Okay, no worries. Don't get panicked. Just simply type U and it will bring back what you just did. Whether it's deleted, deleting a word, a character, or entire line, it will undo. 
And the redo is control R if you wanted to do again what you just did, then of course you could do that. Another thing before we wrap up is if you wanted to, let's say, uh, copy a line and paste it somewhere. So let's say I, I'm, I wanted to have 15 minutes of yoga. I also wanted to have 15 uh, minutes of, uh, for example, uh, weightlifting. So instead of me going in the insert mode, by the way, if I type I right now, it will stay the cursor there and I have to type like this. While the last uh, character and cursor is still blinking on it. So let me get rid of this by hitting X, 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 X. Now, if you wanted to go get into insert mode and wanted to move one cursor or one character ahead, then type A and it will type whatever you wanted to do and this or that, whatever. Now, that's what I was telling you about insert, typing I and typing A. Anyway. What I was trying to tell you is if you wanted to copy this entire line and let's say you wanted to do 15 minutes of um, uh, weightlifting, you could type it in in the next line or why not just copy this entire line and paste it and just change the yoga to weightlifting, right? So let's try that. So first, let's get rid of this, the one that I typed. Now, if you're here, make sure you're not in, in insert mode. I want you to hit YY twice, YY, and now if you type P, it will automatically copy your line to the next line. Now use your cursor, uh, navigating cursor, to go to the end of the word, go to the last word, get rid of that last word by typing X, 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 X. By the way, there is also a way to get rid of the entire, wor entire word or delete the entire word. Uh, and that you can find out yourself. I, I just don't want to take too much of your time. Okay, 15 minutes off. So let's get in here, 15 minutes off. Insert, space, wait, lift. Ding. All right, so that's what I wanted to show you. Okay, so since we added the third line, we co covered how to copy and paste, and there are many other things that you could learn in Vim Editor. So for that, that is why I recommend you to go try those website free uh, practice websites that where you will learn so much. All right, now if you want to save this file, first get out of insert mode, hit escape. Then you could this time let's try uppercase ZZ. So shift ZZ and it got us out. How do we verify it has what it be added? You could do cat and you'll see the last line that's so added. Beautiful. See, that's how you work on BIM editing. I hope you learned a lot. Enjoy and good luck. If you want to learn more about Linux, check out my best selling course on Linux at udemy.com or you could go straight to my website utclsolutions.com and you will find the exact same course there. If you want to learn more about Linux, check out my best-selling course on Linux at udemy.com or you could go straight to my website utclsolutions.com and you will find the exact same course there.